the first three weeks of the eruption here in Hawaii, crazy things would happen in the middle of the night. A new fissure would open up and it would threaten a new neighborhood. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes. I started the Hawaii Tracker Facebook group to help people understand what's going on and get their questions answered. Hey, how's it going? We're live. This is Fissure 20. We had hundreds of people all throughout the neighborhoods sending in videos and articles and images. We spend a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live. It's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story. They were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone, I'm geologist Philip Ong, here with Mr. Dane DuPont of Hawaii Tracker, bringing you guys a Hawaii Tracker Mauna Loa update today. Today we're going to focus on the talk of the, of the island, Mauna Loa, uh, the recent changes, closure of the summit. Um, we're going to uh, postpone our Kilauea and Samoa updates until next week, just know that everything is all good and normal there, nothing to worry about for those. Um, we're going to start off with a special guest today, um, but before we get to that, uh, let me just pass it over to Dane for whatever you want to want to lead us off with, man. Yeah, it is interesting, you know, the timing of everything. We got the, you know, we've had these elevated earthquakes for a couple of weeks now, and now we have this, um, the, I've been calling it basically the advisory plus, right? It's an advisory, um, but it's now daily updates. Normally we associate that with a watch. I did mention this to USGS, and they said that ABO, the Alaska Observatory, does use daily updates at uh, advisory, so it's you know not unique that, but it's kind of different for us. Yeah, we actually saw yeah. Samoa. Yeah, Samoa, they were issuing issuing daily updates at Yellow updates. for a while as well. Yeah, so um, they're kind of two separate systems that often go together, but yeah, they're throwing us a little bit of a change up here. Right. So I've been calling it basically advisory plus advisory plus daily updates, but yeah. Um, that's basically all I got. I'm interested to see what we got in. We do have a special just guest joining us, um, Kaika Marzo. Let's see if we can see in there. Uh, come on, focus. All right. It's not a static picture, I promise. Go ahead, Kaika, <laughs> if you're there. Can you hear me? 
put him a little put him a little bit over to your left. There you go. Oh, can't hear you, Kikes. You there? Uh, okay. Maybe having a little tech difficulty. Well, while while Dan, while Dan works on that, we can we can basically yeah. just summarize that uh, Ikaika has been sharing that there's been a lot of um, requests for information coming in um, as uh, the USGS has changed its its update schedule here that prompted the National Park to close the summit backcountry of Mauna Loa. That's the closure we're referring to here, and with that comes a lot of. Uh, questions about why why now and to some degree some panic because um some people are really not understanding what's going on here so um really the long and short of it is uh to give you guys a little a quick quick intro is that we we are, are having a, a period of magma came to the volcano that has lasted a while but it kind of fits some similar patterns in the past so i think dane might be ready here let's see if you can let's give it a try hey guy see there yeah, I'm here. All right. So yeah, got some action on Mauna Loa. Huh? Yeah, some action. Um, what was that? A couple days in September, got like over 100 earthquakes a day. But, um, I mean, it does this once in a while. Nothing to be uh, alarmed about. Well, a little, but you know, just being informed by you guys. You guys are the main people. I mean, I trust whatever you guys say. So. Uh, how's it going, Phil? How you guys doing? Goody Kaika, goody Kaika. What are you hearing from the community? What are people talking about? What are they asking? And what are they yeah. worried about? Oh, man. Got some action up there. Yeah, so uh, what, what, is, what is uh, everybody talking about? What are they asking about in terms of what's going on? Uh, you know, the news that, that picked up the story and news is going with it. So a lot of people are alarmed. And a lot of people have, have been contacting me about what's going on. And I, I, I've just been saying, you know, it's just... It's been doing this almost every year or every other year. There's a earthquake swarm that happens on the Mauna Loa. And, uh, it's one of those phases, but it's it's definitely above advisory. I mean, you know, there's a lot more earthquakes than happened last year, if I'm not mistaken. But I always tell people, I remember the days of in Leilani Estates back in uh, May 3rd, May 2nd, May 1st. You know, those earthquakes back then was shallow. And the eruption was guaranteed because there are, there are over 500 earthquakes a day. And during that day, oh, we're losing sound there. Uh, I think you're, we're losing you. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so uh, what was that? Hundreds of earthquakes a day, you were saying? Yeah, so like... Uh, Know, back in uh, May 1st, May 2nd, that week before the Leilani uh, eruption, there was definitely, on those last three days, there were definitely over, I would say, over 500 earthquakes a day. I know definitely over three, but it was peaking up to almost five, six hundred, even, maybe even seven. Yeah, definitely. So that, Rocking and rolling. They're saying uh, they released the Volcano Watch Day. We'll get into that uh, later. But one of the things they teased in it was uh, 1984, the last time on a little erupted, talking about uh, earthquakes per minute type thing. There you go. And it's not even close to what happened in 1984. Am I right on that? Uh, Phil? Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get into the details. We'll show you show you some of the graphs. But I mean, I think the important thing here is that people are are really uh, getting triggered by the earthquake swarm and recalling what it was like in Leilani, right? We hear Yikaka talk about that also. But two things are important here. Like one, it's not the same levels of activity. We're a lot less than we saw in 2018. And two, that that location is in the middle of nowhere where people don't live, unlike Leilani. So right. there will be time to to. Uh, adjust and adapt as as the situation evolves if it evolves further and i have my doubts to be honest still i still have some serious doubts that we're going to advance quickly we'll say uh, i think long term it's always been inevitable we've been working for years towards getting this volcano to erupt but uh, i'm still not convinced we're anywhere where that we're near there yet maybe could be but not convincing yet to me right 
so yeah um still got a long way to go on the 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 ramp up to an eruption one of the other things that it's always interesting to point out is just the ch the change in technology that exists uh, between 1984 and now. I mean, it's night and day in terms of the precision, the accuracy, the coverage, um, the amount of polls you can do, everything. Um, so we see a lot, a lot more now than they did in '84. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and we're still figuring out how to how to interpret that data um, since we haven't seen it build up build up to an eruption yet. With our current current setup, current uh, monitoring system, right. So, Keika, great to see you, man. Um, good luck at your music engagement tonight at Kaleos, and um, let us know if we can help you in any other way. Yeah, I don't know if you heard that, Kikes, but um, no, no, I didn't. Oh, uh, we thank you for, you know, joining us tonight, you know, uh, coming on and talking to everybody about Mauna Loa. I know the concern's been high and you've been, you know, getting a lot of people reach out to you on um, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you're playing tonight at the Kaleo's Bar and Grill, yeah? Yeah, we're playing tonight at uh, 6.30 to 7 at Kaleo's Bar and Grill in the uh, Heart of Paul in Orchid Land, actually. In the Heart of so Orchid Land, all right. Yeah, so definitely if you guys are out and about, um, definitely check out Kaika. He normally plays, and his band normally plays Thursdays at Cleo's Bar and Grill. Um, yeah, come check us out. Come check them out. And yeah, we'll let you know anything uh, goes down Mauna Loa. Uh, we'll we'll yeah. shoot you a thing. And there's one thing, too. I just wanted to, you know, congratulate everyone on um, being informed. You know, that's that's a key thing right now is being informed, well informed of what's happening within our communities or on our island. Uh, stay in touch with the right people that gives you the, give you the right information, uh, play by play, and also being prepared. I know it's it's pretty far away from an, an eruption. We're hoping that there's no eruption anytime soon, but there there might be an eruption in the next couple of years, maybe next decade. But being informed and also being prepared is very important, and knowing where you. And if so, there is an eruption that uh, is imminent in the near future. What kind of uh, evacuation policies does the UCLA have evacuation policies? Right. That, if so, an earthquake or oh, if so, an eruption is, um, is upon us. So, you know, I just like to say a uh, big congratulations to all the people that want to be informed, reaching out, and informing their families on what's happening and keep on doing that because um, you know you never know when the next eruption will happen it could happen in your backyard thank you guys thank you Phil thank you Dane yeah Hello. thanks guys next time we'll get you in the stream for sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> none of the phone tag all right man yeah. Uh, mahalo once again, Kaika. Thanks, Dane, for setting it up. And apologies to you guys that I had to watch the phone. We're, we're yeah. trying to get, get live here, but we got a little late and got some issues. And that's that was yeah. how we could get it to work on short notice today. Yep. The, the primary strategy went down immediately. So that was the backup. <laughs> Thank you for everybody. But yeah, it's always good to hear from Kikes. And, you know, I. What he says is important, you know, just to know the basics, really. I mean, which volcano are you in the path of? That's a question I've been actually seeing more over the past day, right? Um, people coming in. We had a bunch of people join the group over the past day. Um, that's why Tracker on Facebook. I think we had about 500 requests in just like the last 12 hours to join. Um, and a lot of people are like, is, you know, I'm in Pune, is, is Mauna Loa going to get me? You know, it's like, you, you start, you know, start one is like, which volcano am I worried about here um, in particular, right? Which one can get me? And that's kind of just the start. And, you know, uh, we're going to go a lot more in depth than that. But it's always good to, you know, go back to basics sometime. Yeah, so I think the the... the take home message for everyone that USGS is trying to put out and they will... will... Uh, reaffirm is that preparedness is really the key here, right? So, I mean, this is a chance to be more prepared. It's a chance to to get together your all hazard plan, right? So, it's not just volcanoes and eruptions, but it could be other things, earthquakes or hurricanes or you know, 
any number of these uh, disasters that could occur that require you to have a, uh, a go bag, for example, and evacuation routes and meeting points for your family and all those kind of things, uh, communication plans, how you're going to uh, talk to people. Um, yeah. Those kind of things are important all the time. And this is a great chance to, to um, prompt everyone to update your plan or do it if you haven't yet or all those kind of things, right? Regardless of where you are, if you're even on Mauna Loa or not, because, you know, earthquakes can hit yeah. anywhere and they're really, really good everyone. And honestly, the lava is going to get very, very few people, um, if any at all, from Mauna Loa, really, if we're lucky. So earthquakes, however, yeah. will affect everybody. And, you know, um, that's that's really the big picture there, right? So we're going to talk about all the details. Um, we're going to go through all the monitoring signals. We'll, we'll go, go through, first of all, what is it that's going on that has happened recently um, as far as, you know, where and when and... Um, those those kind of things, and then we'll we'll transition to the greater context of the the why and the, the how exactly, and those kind of details, and what would we expect as an eruption begins, and all those things uh, on on the second part of our broadcast here. So that's how I have it laid out, and you know the first the first part really is just uh, what's happened recently, the the USGS response, and and a little bit of the the similar pattern that it falls into um, over the last many years, actually. So all right. Yeah, definitely interesting. Um, well, let's get into it. I know a lot of people want to hear about Mauna Loa. It's been the talk of Tracker for the past day since this alert came out and then the subsequent closure of the backcountry summit trails by the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. All right, so started off showing you guys here. This is a, a image of Mauna Loa summit today and just showing you that it is quiet up there. There's, there's not anything visually happening at the summit. Um, I have seen some mentions of people maybe looking at the cameras and seeing some steam, but that's something we've we've addressed over the years, over and over and over. There's always steam up there, depending on the wet weather and a day and, and what the camera's catching and all of that. So we don't see anything unusual happening uh, visually anywhere, and that's what the USGS is also uh, also stating there. So not just at the summit, but Upper Southwest Rift, uh, all the monitoring stations, there's no gas, nothing like that is happening there. So, uh, but... Let's see here. There we go. To start off, uh, let's just play you guys a little loop here. This is something I captured from the Iris Earthquake browser, and I tried to blow it up so you could see it a little better here. But we're zoomed into Mauna Loa Summit over here. And what we have is earthquakes uh, over the last uh, about two weeks or so from um, September 21st. And here's on this part of the graph, you're seeing the earthquakes per hour is what this is actually plotting on here. So you see there really were two bursts. One was on the 23rd. And another one was on the 29th here, and lots of other action in between. But you can see from the animation here, that's, that's kind of looping between the, the visual satellite view there and the map view. Uh, these are all happening in the usual areas within that summit caldera of Mokua Veo Veo, just to the southwest and that upper southwest rift zone area. I mean, and we refer to that as upper southwest rift zone a lot, but it's really part of that summit uh, complex reservoir. And it's not really going in a southwest rift there. It's just that's just how how that thing is set up. That's part of the summit, the summit southwest rift connector, maybe. Um, and then off to the northwest here in this area, that seems to catch all the stress, all the the, the pressure that builds up and gets pushed against in, in this area. So that's a visual of what actually has happened over the last week or so. This is the two days of earthquakes that reached over 100, 100 earthquakes per day on the 23rd and 29th here. And that is the where and the when of it. And back to this as needed. But uh, in response, what we have here, let's see if I can make this bigger in case anyone is trying to read along. And maybe I shouldn't. Oh, there we go. I'm having some a little bit of lag in my browser today, but there we go. Starting off with, a, with an update from last week, September 29th. And last week's update, not erupting, no significant changes, was still being stated at that point in time. and. However, the big key there was that they had over 400 small magnitude earthquakes beneath the summit elevations in that one week. So 400 in a week is is high compared to what numbers we've been seeing, and that's really capturing those events on there, right? And so this is kind of the, the, the beginning prompt of it. So here they note that elevated activity began under Mauna Loa in mid-2022, but intensified at approximately 2 a.m. on a 23rd. And earthquakes have continued at rates of 50 per day. This is still last week. 
Um, and most of these were small, and uh, the largest at that point was 2.8. So we'll move forward from that to the update that was issued yesterday. And the one yesterday is what really kind of prompted a lot of this um, concern, we'll say, right? And really, the first statement of the update yesterday, uh, Mauna Loa is not erupting, and there are no signs of an imminent eruption at this time. That's the most important thing we can say. That's the most important thing that's just a saying. They're repeating themselves on that. Mauna Loa is not erupting, and there are no signs of an imminent eruption at this time. The thing that threw us off was this came out on a Wednesday, and normally the updates come out on Thursdays every week. And what they do note is that, however, Mauna Loa is currently experiencing heightened unrest. Earthquake activity has been increasing from 5 to 10 earthquakes per day since June 2022 to 10 to 20 earthquakes per day in July and August, and reaching approximately 40 to 50 earthquakes per day over the past two weeks. Peak numbers of over 100 earthquakes per day occurred on September 23rd and 29th. Inflation or expansion of Mauna Loa Summit is accompanying the earthquake activity and has also increased in the past two weeks. The last time Mauna Loa displayed similar elevated earthquake activity and expansion of the summit region was late January to late March of 2021. Additional periods of increased earthquake activity have also occurred during the 38 years since the last eruption of Mauna Loa in 1984. So we'll go through some of those details here, but just to make sure we cover the official releases first. Alert level remains at advisory yellow. However, beginning October 6th today, Updates are now changed from weekly to daily, reflecting the heightened level levels on, of unrest. Uh, HVO is continuing to monitor conditions carefully and will issue appropriate updates if conditions change. So we'll actually see updates every day. However, um, moving to today's update, I expect other ones to be similar to this. Today's update, Mauna Loa is not erupting, no signs of imminent eruption at this time. And also, monitoring data showed no significant changes in the past day. Earthquake rates are elevated and indicating Mauna Loa is currently experiencing heightened unrest. GPS measurements show continued surface deformation related to inflation of a magma chamber beneath the summit. So I would not expect this to change. That little summary is probably going to be the same tomorrow and the next day, and that's probably that's what would be normal, right? And if something does change, I'm sure they will change it, but at present there is no indication that anything is progressing beyond what happened earlier in the week. So over the last 24 hours, we've had 44 small magnitude earthquakes below 3.0. And these are all in the shallow depths uh, of the volcano. And everything else is still consistent in the same. And I won't read all the rest of the details for you guys there. So that's, that was the, the uh, USGS uh, releases. And in response, this was from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park yesterday, that Mauna Loa Summit has been closed due to increased seismic activity. And this is a backcountry area. It's an area that's not visited very often. It requires a backcountry permit. There's no road that goes there. Most visitors are not going to make it up there. This is just something that uh, certain people uh, are going to be interested in, right? So um, it does appear that the National Park and USGS are working more in sync, more closely in sync, and more closely in time with their actions. And so we're seeing that piggybacking onto the USGS uh, statements yesterday as well. So that is really, um, to me, was the, 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 the more notable event um, that we have this coordination in place. And that's good to see because uh, if something does escalate quickly, you want to make sure that all those wheels are greased for sure. So that's, that's the, the response. And I thought I would next show this slide that comes from Frank Trusdell from a talk he gives in Mauna Loa. And, shows us many, many times. And this goes back to 2002, uh, October, right? And comes from the Tribune Herald. And this is a cartoon when the volcano scientists is declaring that there is a slight swelling in a mountain and all the media in that case starts shouting eruption is imminent. And so of course there's a great media interest in this event. However, an eruption is not imminent. However, you should be aware of the hazards and be informed and be prepared for whenever uh, an event does occur, right? So just want to reemphasize that here and a good chance to bring that up here. So let's give you guys some context of these earthquakes, right? We've, we've, I've shown you guys just the last couple weeks here of activity, but now I'm going to go back to the last uh, three or four months or so. Let's see if I can get this IRS earthquake browser to animate these and... There, there it goes, and I'm going to leave it kind of zoomed out here to start. So you can really see that these earthquakes are in a very small area near the summit of the volcano, not really reaching near the coast, um, and not really near any of our communities that are inhabited here, right? So it's really localized to the summit region, 
I can zoom it in a little bit more so you can see the, the loop. Let me actually loop here. This is back in April, right? And what you can see in April is that we're starting to have earthquakes in this summit region and this region to the northwest. They're at slower rates. But we did actually have in August, right here in August, a big burst that prompted um, concern at that point as well. And then more recently, we have the same areas activating once again. So really, the, the areas on a map haven't changed. You're just getting getting denser with these little dots that are tracking the location of earthquakes underground there. So that is the earthquake browser. And let me advance here to the graph. I hope we'll load before too long here. So it's important to look at the earthquake rates in the context of, of the last month, the last five years, the last year, and um, as well as with the GPS data on browser here. I've had to update some of this software on a computer, and unfortunately, this has been in effect this past week. Get this to come on. There it is. All right, earthquake rates past month on Mauna Loa. So here is the last month graph. We're looking at earthquakes per day on the left, and this is one month of time here on the bottom. Current day is this one right here on the right. So you can see the 23rd would be here that day, and the 30th is this day. Those are the two days that exceeded 100 earthquakes per day. There's a threshold right there. You can see that the, the uh, 30th also came close, didn't quite pass that threshold right there. But you can see that over the last week, the activity ramped up, peaked, came down a little bit, up again, and then down, or maybe more generally, broadly came up, and now seems to be going back down. And so not to say it can't come back up still, but this particular phase that prompted these changes is, is currently winding down. That's what we can tell from this week. Presently, we have a little bit further back in time. This goes back to August. This is the last... Uh, Two months then, and this comes from the Volcano Watch article that we're going to share with you guys here shortly. So um, August to October 2022, and on the bottom, earthquake rates as before. And on the top, we see in the blue dots the GPS line length across summit of Mauna Loa. And you can see that it's been as a positive slope, which means the sides of the crater are getting further apart, which just like in Kilauea means magma is coming in below and injecting and swelling that big magma reservoir that we think of, think of like a balloon. And as it swells, the sides get pushed further and further apart. So when this line has got a, a slope that's rising, then that's what's happening. It's getting further apart. In this case, it's getting apart, further apart, a little bit slower. And since the last couple of weeks, you can see it's also been rising, um, spreading apart faster than that. Right. So you have uh, not just one signal, which is something we often often. Uh, describe the need for when we have other earthquake swarms as we want to see multiple signals uh, all giving different um, different angles at, and coming to the same conclusion that there's something happening. So we do see earthquakes and the GPS in the blue. And in green here is the tilt. And this is a summit tilt and there's a lot of up and down wiggles. That's the, the cycles that you see in a daily and weekly basis. So more important is just an average value that's basically low and then coming up. And actually, if I zoom into the top right here, it's gone flat again since then, right? There's a little bit of an offset that occurs right in here in the middle and then it stabilizes. So really we had an event that lasted this period of time and it seems to be also in a tilt um, over. However, the GPS is still rising a bit and we'll look into that here a little bit more as we progress. So but we normally look at the GPS on this year long view. This is the vertical motion. Um, the vertical is showing a rise as well and Likewise, it was coming up um, at a decent rate, and that rate has accelerated in the last last few months here. Um, as far as vertical motion, you can see it's, it's not drastically going straight up or anything. Um, but the volcano is complex in the sense where it can both go upwards and outwards. And so sometimes it's more out and less up, and sometimes it's out and down or out and up. And that's what we're seeing now is we're seeing it go up. And if I scroll it up here, you'll see it's going out also. And on this one year one year plot, it does look like it's fairly steep. That's the, the data we just showed you zoomed in for the last two months here. So you can see much more clear now this trend 
of spreading. And so likely this is all all um, telling us the little wiggles in that upper summit caldera area, where you see like there are times where it appears to to be spreading and then contracting and spreading. If this is to be believed, these these nuances in the data here. Um, and now we have a more convincing, longer lasting signal that is uh, prompting all of this, right? So in case you were curious, and we've been discussing this over the last few weeks, like what is enough? This is met the threshold for enough to cause these changes to occur, whereas some of these previously were just not quite there, right? Although they were hinting at uh, what we're seeing now to come this instability in the system. So it's moving upwards and outwards. Let's keep going. And this is the five year plot. So really, I gotta zoom way into this right hand side over here, if I can. There it is, right? So that rise is just this little bit right in here, a little dip right before it there and there. That's it. And the reason I want to show the five year plot is you can see that back in 2021, early 2021, we had this similar event in 2021, but it was followed by in late 2020, a similar contraction, stabilization and rising. And then after that, it actually once again contracted, right? So the reason you're having this, this effect at the summit, and it's important to, to note that, let me see if I can get this map back up here. It's important to note that this, this is a summit distance just between these two stations and here. And often the deformation can spread outwards beyond there, right? So we're only measuring distance from here to here. If we had a station that was out here, and when it was out here, we could measure the distance all the way across, we might see a different signal that's that's uh, broader and less localized than the one we're, the one we're seeing here. So that, just, just to say that, because um, there are times when a summit can be contracting like this, but it likely means that the flanks of the volcano are pushing outwards, and the magma is not just disappearing, it's moving into other parts of the volcano elsewhere, also not erupting, but accommodating that volume somewhere else. Right. So this is what the volcano actually does. Is it uh, it's spreading and filling and spreading and filling and spreading and filling continuously. And what we really care about as people on a surface is when is it going to fill so much that the spreading can't accommodate it and it's going to have to pop out the top as well on top of what we see, right? So the, the moving back and forth itself is not alarming. It's part of what the volcano does. And so it seems like that's happened in 2021. It seems like it's happening again now. And this may or may not lead to an eruption. It did not lead to one in 2021. It did not lead to one the previous time this happened back in 2014 and 15, or the time before that back in 2002 to 2005 as well. So we've actually had many of these these little wiggles in the data um, since the last eruption, and none of those has erupted. And that's why I still harbor some doubts. I would say uh, it's kind of based on that. That and a lack. You don't have any gas coming out, and you would expect to see gas when a magma is coming shallower. Um, we do know it's shallower than than many times in the past because our tilt meters are actually registering signals of, of deformation, right? And normally that has to be a pretty shallow signal. So call it within the upper two miles of the volcano. If the magma is up in there moving around, then a tilt meter maybe can detect it. So we are seeing it do that, but we're not seeing it shallow beyond that to put out gas yet, right? And it may or may not do that. So we will have to wait longer to really find out, find out what's going on. Um, however, um, this five-year GPS right, um, has a corresponding five-year earthquake plot. And here you can see there is that period of increased seismicity back in early 2021. Now, this is earthquakes per month now, so it's, it's going to keep changing the values in you guys a little bit, but the actual relative numbers are what, what matters. Um, here we are at the very far, far right end of this, and we've actually exceeded 1,000 earthquakes in September uh, due to those two events. Uh, which uh, were preceded by uh, a little less than 600, a little more than 400. So really, we've had like a three-month buildup here. And this is the when I showed you guys a plot of the last four, three or four months. We're really seeing this ramp up right here of activity. Right? And of course, because um, these buckets of one month are a little bit arbitrary, right? you might have a similar n total number of those three and these three. Um, it's just kind of distributing a little bit different. right? So it's comparable. Will happen in early 2021. However, we are actually uh, hitting a higher rate per month in September here, right? So very noteworthy. And you can see how looking at this graph, you would be also prompted to make some um, changes and maybe address concerns of the people if you're the USGS and the National Park. And 
we go back here to early 2018, right? And so previous to this 20, late 2017, 2018, um, things were different, but we had quiet as Kilauea was erupting and um, building to eruption and collapsing. It's really been since then we've seen this build up, right? So we'll kind of focus on that a little bit here to start. But um, we can look at the tilt. Here, this is the tilt for the last month, and I mentioned this as well. Here is that, that little bit of rise right there, right? This is, we're looking at something about three micro radians. Um, if I zoom it in, there's a little bit of an offset that happens right there. You see the blue line jumps and this big green line, which is all, another component of the tilt meter, is also showing this, this big jolt and coming back and then being offset a little bit as well. And so that typically indicates a shallow earthquake. This is happening, it looks like, on a, on a 30th, just before the, the 1st of October. And there is a similar event that occurred um, back in April, but first let's look at the earthquake map and figure out what that one might have been. So here is our USGS earthquake map of the summit, and we're looking at the last seven days here and look, looking at the newest ones. We'll go through this in this manner first. We're seeing that almost all these earthquakes are all above sea level. We're showing negative values here. Minus 0.6 kilometers means above sea level within the the edifice within the actual structure of the mountain there, right? So minus 0.6, minus 1.6, minus 0.6, minus 1.3. So a lot of these earthquakes are are shallow, which are showing adjustment of that shallower surface to magma building below there. Um, going back, you can see there's there are, are some deeper ones coming down to the two kilometer range somewhere in there. So let me come up here and sort this by largest magnitude first. And the largest one on April 30th, or I'm sorry, on September 30th, was a 3.5 at negative 0.7 kilometers, that means 7, 700 meters above sea level, and that falls right in here. And you can see where that earthquake was, 3.5, and that's likely the one that caused a little offset. So um, no surprise, having big earthquakes at the, sum at the summit at the surface uh, is something noteworthy, of course, um, but it's not unique, right? We can go back to Let's come back to this April 8th, 2021 Mauna Loa Summit Interferogram in the SAR image released by the USGS, which followed a shallow earthquake that occurred on March 6th, 2021, that actually caused some deformation. Right? There's an earthquake mapped on this map, and a little bit of the NSAR signal localized to the earthquake there, but also denoting this broad deformation field from some inflation. Right, so. This is why I say when a whole summit's swelling like this and we're only measuring distance measurements from here to here, there could you're not really catching all of it and you could be having more localized effects than the entire big picture there. So this has happened before, even this year. Shallow earthquakes and um, we're just uh, waiting for the progression and so far it's like before, it seems to be winding down after that surface adjustment. Um, okay, there's another interferogram release back from um, July this year as well. And this follows uh, another kind of build up area on Mauna Loa, so uh, build, build up era. So in this case, the summit broadly also showing inflation. So I'm just kind of setting a, the pattern that this has been happening for a while. And so let's see if we actually had a total, a total range of change here. Um, but there is a few millimeters of inflation at Mauna Loa. Uh, during that time frame, frame of June to July, right? So it has been swelling broadly there. there that's the July image right there. Um, I'm going to go back to the Volcano Watch that was released back in August. This is August 11th. And this follows an August 2nd uh, earthquake swarm as well. So we'll look at the map of that. Here it is, same locations. In this case, it was mostly that shallower summit region and less so to the northwest, that more intermediate depth there. Um, but uh, in that case, on August 2nd, the total number of earthquakes peaked at over 200 per hour, right there, counting all the very, very small ones. And of the ones that were located, 90 located beneath the summit region over a period of about 10 hours. So that was uh, maybe not as long, didn't last as long as the event we're having now, but you can see that these peaks are also 
quite large compared to what, what we've what we're used to seeing. So I'm gonna scroll down here to show you guys similar plots. Right here's a plot that was released of the tilt meter with fluctuations there as usual, tilt increase with a small offset from an earthquake as well. And it's a very similar pattern on that tilt meter to what we're seeing today, really over the last week. And correspondingly, earthquakes per hour down here below, um, rising up, back down. And in this plot, this is depth and time. And these depth time plots are nice, especially when you give us resolution. In this case, it's only, only four days or so, three days or so. So you really can see that as time went on, the earthquakes started off at a certain depth and basically see that that depth didn't really migrate anywhere, anywhere else beyond that. And so that's what happened back in um, August. All right, so moving forward, stepping forward, we have here a follow-up from Dane to the USGS um, asking for more recent NSAR from Mauna Loa. And so we have a response from the USGS today. And here is an NSAR image. But more useful is their, their captions, right? Which they say, most of the recent scenes have been heavily contaminated by the atmosphere. And so they don't show much that is useful, example attached. And so when you see an image like this, what you're mostly, let's see if I can get it bigger here. What you're mostly seeing is these rainbow colored rings. That's the, the atmosphere. Uh, different elevations of the volcano. That, that's all stuff that, even though it's the prettiest thing in the image, just what you have to ignore. What they're saying is really the most real signal is what you're seeing in the area right in here, and probably especially this little fringe that's more localized right here. So this is the area just south and east of that main summit caldera, where the, the inflation center of every episode that we've been able to, to record with instruments in history have all all inflated from this area over here, kind of underneath this rim. Right? So it's thought that there's maybe a sill or some kind of like near horizontal blade that connects off in this direction over here. That's a quasi magma chamber, you know, magma reservoir. The shallow system of it is in that area. So you probably can believe that changes are happening around here, but we knew that already from all the other data. And otherwise, um, great to have the engagement. Um, you can see here a couple of comments, Jaw, G-Hub, how much the signal is real, and the answer comes in almost none. All the fringes are atmospheric, ex except a few right near the summit caldera, and those are distorted by incoherence due to snow in a December image. And so you can see that there's some challenges, not just from the atmosphere and moisture in the air, but also moisture on the ground in the form of snow in this particular case. So we're almost through the, 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 uh, the what happened here, but I'm going to going to tease a little bit uh, before we take our break and start looking at questions here. Um, this is an image that comes from a paper by Varugo and Amalung last year, 2021. What these guys have been doing out of the University of Miami is modeling all the changes, in GPS especially, and seismicity, um, and INSAR as well, to try to understand the shapes and volumes of magma coming into the volcano underground. So to kind of give you a concept of what's happening in the volcano and what has been happening for the last many years. Uh, we'll start with this panel up here on the top left, 2014 to 2015. During that era of time, magma is coming into the volcano from below, and it's building this big blade of lava, which is always there in Mauna Loa. That's part of the summit magma reservoir. But because it's being built at a greater speed from below, it's kind of got, it's gotten a little bit thicker here, right? And it's focused underneath the summit region in particular. The summit caldera is right there. So what happens is as the magma is coming up and it's reaching this zone of neutral buoyancy, right? Neutral buoyancy means it's the same density as the stuff around it. It doesn't need to rise anymore. And it can basically stay at the elevation and move sideways more so. So all the material comes up here and it starts moving off to the side, propagating to the south. So the next increment of time, 2015 to 2018, you see that the, the, uh, the dike, this big blade of lava, is progressed more so to the southwest and has also reduced its vertical extent here, right? And that's partly because the actual rate of lava coming in has gone down. And so 2018 to 2020, it picks back up a little bit, and we start seeing stress accumulation and earthquakes occurring around the perimeter of this thing as well, right? So this explains why we have a little bit more to the southwest under that southwest rift upper connector right in here. 
but also underneath the summit, that's the, the idea of how this has actually been modeled, right? So to give you some idea of these numbers, this is the number here, 28 million cubic meters per year is the, the number from 2014 to 15. This was a, a, an episode of larger volume intrusion, right? And just to put things in context, right, we've been watching Kilauea for a while here. We know that in the last year, Kilauea has put out about 111 million cubic meters into its summit crater, right? 111. So we're looking at one quarter of that rate that's filling Kilauea is what was going into Mauna Loa 2014, 2015. Now it's going to Kilauea is, is, a, is a very healthy, robust amount, right? But it actually gives you some basis of comparison, imagining the hole on Kilauea and how it's been filled in and how much of that um, is filling underground out of sight in Mauna Loa within that blade here, right? So 28 million down to 12 million. That's maybe what, one eighth of what we have, have now in Kilauea. And then up to 17 million, maybe one sixth or so, but still all fractions of what we're seeing on Kilauea today. Two graphs on the, bo on the bottom, this is magma influx here. Coming in gives you an idea of what's actually coming in. So magma came in more 2002 to 2005, slowed down a bit, uh, was not filling according to the model until 2014, 2014 and 15. It starts injecting the magma more quickly and then more steadily at, at a slower rate since then, but still coming in. And that contrasts to this plot on the right, which is actually a flank motion, right? And I'll get to this here in a second. But really, the flank of the volcano, the side that's on Kilauea's side, is moving. Kilauea is moving. Mauna Loa is moving in response. And that opens the area in the summit for this magma to come and fill in. So that's why this motion on the flank is important. And you can see in this plot on the right here, let's zoom it in, um, how much the flank has been, has been moving. So there are times where the flank moves faster and times when it moves slower. And that combined with the magma coming in is what actually creates these models, right? So here, this is basically the idea. And to answer the question, I'm sure that is the, the, the foremost in everyone's mind, what's actually going on up there? The answer is magma is still continuing to fill in, come into this blade. And as this rate possibly increases a little bit, it's starting to push, push its way to the side and possibly on a margin slightly upwards as well, right? But it has not actually made a push towards the surface which is a whole separate thing, um, which we are wanting to be wary of and to, to uh, educate you about, but we're not seeing signs of that yet. And that's, that's the whole imminent eruption part of the, of the update here. So um, that is the first part, and then there's a lot more to talk about, the Volcano Watch, the comparisons to other eruptions and those kind of things. Um, but perhaps at this point we can take a little break and address what I'm sure uh, is that healthy chatter there in a chat, Dane. Um, what's going on over there? Yeah, we got a few questions that came in. Um, if you do have questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. And we'll make sure to get to them. Um, we rely on the questions coming in from chat to really fill in the gaps on what we're missing, something like that, and community concern. We do have a couple here. Um, one from Joe on YouTube who asks, how do all these pump fakes, you know, I refer to that as the Mauna Loa uh, increased activity that doesn't lead to eruption as pump fake. Um, how do the pump fakes compare to the data before an actual eruption back in 1984? All right, that's the next part of the update. All right, punt. So we'll do. That. All right, yeah. we'll punt that <laughs> to keep with the analogy. Um, Raya Lin, I think that's I might pronounce that wrong. Asks uh, thoughts on lava trajectory is uh, flow towards Kona or Hilo or high populated areas evacuation plan uh, post. So asking for evacuation plans and more about that. Um, the link I dropped for you, if you want to pull that up potentially, um, is the post I did a month ago about the Truesdale inundation zones. Those are really, if you want to compartmentalize Mauna Loa and be able to work with it in a more manageable way. We'd really recommend looking at the Truesdale inundation zone. Frank Truesdale, known as Mr. Mauna Loa, this is his way with uh, Mike Zowler they came up with to help emergency uh, responders and all the management agencies to come up with a way to figure out where to evacuate, where not to, um, where's in danger, where's not. And it's done via lava sheds. And these are basically areas that can contain the flow via uh, uh, topographical features. So 
that's one way. The, the problem is, is there really isn't much of a plan, you know, like Mauna Loa plan for public review. That doesn't, there isn't one um, in, in the detail you probably want. That's the hard truth of it. Um, so it comes down to people being ready and people being informed themselves, right? Because there might not be somebody to help you in case of a really bad eruption, right? You might have to make the judgments and, you know, rely on partial information to make a decision. And this is how you fill in those gaps. So, yeah, Phil. Um, I've tried to pull, up, pull this up here, but you can kind of see it. But really, the, fa the Facebook browser uh, is not, not going to let me see the whole post here. So um, you can look for that um, on Facebook or uh, on the HawaiiTracker.com site. If it's not there quite yet, it will be reposted shortly, I believe. I will post a link to it. Um, however, to kind of get back to the get back to the question here, um, where where might it actually flow? Um, the answer is nowhere, right yet, right? Because it hasn't actually come out and gone anywhere um, for it to actually go, and, and that's kind of kind of the first the first step of it, right? You know, we're seeing all this activity of that's picking up on our instruments, um, but. If we didn't have any of these instruments, you would have no indication that this is going on, right? If, if this was 200 years ago and we're living in Kona, like you're not seeing a big cloud coming from the sun. Like you're not seeing any extra heat. You're not really feeling big earthquakes that are that much beyond normal yet, right? So we haven't quite got to that phase where where uh, we need to worry about where lava is going to go quite yet, right? Um, that's kind of part one. Um, part two, when eruptions on Mauna Loa begin, they always begin at the summit. And the summit's got a big caldera. It's almost at 14,000 feet. It's far from everything. So even when lava comes out of the summit caldera in those early phases, it rarely will like, get far enough to actually reach any people or any infrastructure or anything like that. So no need to worry about that quite yet either, right? So really when it comes to the Truesdale zones and other things, you really have to have the lava exiting the rift zones and summit area and then you can say okay given this direction it might flow towards here and it would take x amount of time right and so most of the, most of the time you have um, some time to to prepare as well right especially if it's going to the north um, or to the east right um, if it's in the southwest sector then that's the, the area that we worry about the most because there's a least time from an outbreak at the rift zone to lava coming downhill and affecting really transportation mostly um, immediately. So uh, especially if you live in the Southwest sector, you should always be prepared. You should always have that go bag ready, no matter what, just because you just never know something crazy could actually happen, you know, but that's that, that would kind of break a lot of the patterns we see. And um, I will put forth um, some data, um, that leads me to believe that we're actually going to see an eruption more similar to 1975 than to 1984, right? which was a, a, a summit-only eruption that lasted only 19 hours, less than one full day at the summit. And that, was, that set the stage for the 84 eruption later on, right? So it was, it was really like a one-day eruption, but there was really a whole, it was a whole week-long crisis because after the eruption, the magma migrated. We saw the, to the, the GPS moving. Um, well, I should call it electronic distance, right? Because there was no GPS at the time. But um, the distances across the, the, the summit and the rift zones were, were, were changing. Um, earthquakes were ongoing for a whole week afterwards. And like that's what the crisis actually was. And I would argue, and I'll come to this in this next segment, that you can't have an 84 eruption occur without, uh, without having that set up ahead of time. And so... If 84 kind of seems to come up suddenly, it comes up suddenly in a context of having having been ha had this, the table set for it nine years prior, 1975. So more details on that in a bit. Um, but re I mean, really, the, the 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 advice we can give is, you know, for what Dane said about the true and inundation zones. If you really want to take action, which is what we always encourage, right? You can go find your your location on the true cell inundation zone, and that directs you to let's see if i can get an example here if i can let's try this facebook page again let's see if i can click on something if it'll yeah just see if we can pull one here. of them up all right so there's one for example 
Um, this is looking at the helo side, right? So, for example, if you're on, on a helo side, and let's say that you're um, in Kiao, say, Kiao area is in this, this kind of pinkish area right in here, then you would know that uh, the source of lava into that lava shed would have to be this part of the rift zone, this yellow part right in here. So lava would have to come out of here and go into there, and so until lava reaches this area, this whole area of Kiao is in the clear. Right? Most of downtown Hilo, the Kiao Kaha, is this blue in the middle here, and that corresponds to this segment of the rift zone. This is a northeast rift zone now, right here. So if lava were to come all the way down and actually leave the rift zone into this, this lava shed, then we'd expect it to stay within this area, and this would be the area that would be affected, right? So not until lava actually progresses from the summit, which is actually off this map, all the way down and all the way through here, could you then say, okay, now we know where it's going. So I'm still trying to answer the question of where might it actually go, and give the caveat question. that until it actually gets all the way out of this yellow zone, you really don't know where it's going to go. Because this, this whole area is full of cinder cones and cracks, and it's like a big pinball machine. It can bounce around in here all over the place and pop out the other side. Or bounce around in here and pop out over here instead. Right? So um, this shed is the one that goes to Kalmana area, North Hilo, right? And, and that's the area that if lava was going down towards a saddle, then it would turn and go over in this direction over there. And like this gives an idea of how you can use these maps to delineate what area of the eruption of the volcano you'd have to worry about just for yourself. Because the honest, the honest uh, uh, truth is Mauna Loa covers over half of the island, nearly half the island. And a lot of people are on Mauna Loa, right? Hilo is on Mauna Loa. Uh, and I hope Mauna Bay is on Mauna Loa, right? There's um, a lot of areas, all of, all of uh, Milo'i and... Well, Kina is all on Mauna Loa, right? Um, South Point, um, Mauna Loa. There's a lot of a lot of, uh, of us are on Mauna Loa. But as Dana's described before, this is like a big roulette wheel, and it's going to spin around. It's going to only land on one of these areas, most likely. It may, maybe more than one, depending if the flow splits and goes. And, you know, but it's not going to pick all of them. And so only at that point in time, we'll really know where the lava is actually flowing. Right? That's the best answer we can give. So um, it really depends on, on where it comes out. But... Really, bottom line, I'd, until it actually leaves the summit or leaves the rift zone, you really don't know where it's going, and you can't really worry about it um, until it, until it's going towards one of those one of those zones, right? You can be ready for all eventualities, whether those are lava flows or earthquakes or power outages or what have you, um, any of those things, um, regardless, right? And that's encouraged, no matter what, right? Um, I think that gets us through the questions right now. Um, if anybody, I'll go back through and you know check one more time before we end the Q&A. I do want to acknowledge, though, some of the Super Chats and support we've had come through. We have $50 from our longtime supporter, Gary Bryan. It says, thank Dane and Phil for these in-depth review and updates. Thank you for that continued support, Gary. We have Scott Get Ed, continued support as well. Phil and Dane, appreciate all the effort. Go have a beer on me. We'll do afterwards. Uh, $20 from Fisher 8 Tours. Just a shaka. And then we have... Forty nine ninety nine from twelve time. Keep up the great work. Uh, appreciate that one as well. Appreciate everybody in chat. If you do uh, support this type of content, make sure like, subscribe, share. Sharing really does help. All that helps with the algorithm. I know people beat it to death on YouTube, but it really is true. Um, if you want more, you know, we're trying to get this out there to more people, so the the real information makes through the hype, really. Um, because there's a lot of it, especially in the news media. I mean, it, it, it comes almost um, not even worth paying attention to at some points. But, you know, USGS, that's, you know, definitely stuff we pay attention to, right? Um, let's see here. Any more questions coming through? There's a lot, a lot, a lot uh, of good questions in there. Yeah. But it sounds like a lot of those have to do with information I still have lined up. So, um... right. <laughs> Maybe Let's just save a lot of those, and we'll go through the next section. And if they're still outstanding, throw them back in, copy paste them, and we'll get them. All right, sounds good. So let me pull up here what I have next. Um, I have some things a little bit out of order here, just because it was scramble today. And when I click, wait for the lag. Okay, so I'm gonna show you guys a couple more things. All right, first here, this is the uh, current last 48 hours summit seismograph uh, showing the, what the earthquakes look, look like on a, on a record here. Right? So 
you can see there's lots of small events that are just showing up as these little spikes and a couple of these longer ones that have these these fatter heads and tail off there right um so earthquakes are happening you can see these are all very small events and occasional little bigger ones nothing too big um you see a couple of these these bands of that look like this is what might look look, look like harmonic tremor possibly or it could be wind or like a aircraft flying nearby um, it's hard to tell when they're just by themselves what we don't see is like something picking up and staying staying vibrating for a long time which which is one of the pieces of evidence that the usgs is using here that the eruption is not imminent um, because there is no tremor visible right and it is no notable that once tremor is visible it's not going to be a whole whole lot of time probably hours before it breaks out through the surface so um that's just cool. It's for all the guys who believe that Mauna Loa is going to erupt, let's say, in the next 48 hours. That there's really no, no sign of that happening um, on the data here. It's showing earthquakes happening, but not at an alarming rate. Nothing like that. So, all right, that's the, uh, the, the graph. Um, let me switch over here to my next set of slides. And maybe what we'll do first here is talk about Volcano Watch this week, because this is going to open up this, this can of worms that everyone is talking about as well. So, Volcano Watch this week from the SGS. Recent events at Mauna Loa remind us to be prepared for quick changes. So quick changes is the theme here of this article. So, the last eruption of Mauna Loa occurred in 1984 and began in a typical style of volcano. Style typical of volcano. At 55 p.m. on March 24th, 1984, the rates of earthquakes under Mauna Loa started to rapidly pick up. While rates of earthquakes were already above normal, it quickly rose to two to three earthquakes per minute. So this is written by the USGS. Today is by geophysicist Ingrid Johansson. Mahalo, Ingrid. By 11.30 p.m., so strong seismic tremor had begun, indicating magma was moving underground and getting close to the surface. And then two hours later, eruption began at 1.30 a.m. on the 25th of the summit. Uh, now, stated here, the rapid onset of extreme unrest leading to eruption 84 is typical of the monolo eruptions that have been observed in the last two centuries. I'm going to push back against this a little bit, but... Um, but this, in a, in, a, in, a, in a small scale, this is true, right? You're looking at a day to hour phase. This is, this is how it is. Um, in addition to rapid onset, eruptions that, either, eruptions that migrate down either of Mauna Loa's rift zones tend to be high volume and resulting lava flows can move quickly from the eruptive vents downslope towards the ocean. As described in a volcano watch March 11th, lava flows are moving down the steep slopes of Kona, South Kona, can reach the ocean as soon as three to four hours after the start of a rift eruption. So the combination of rapid onset, large lava volumes, and vast lava flows can make monolithic eruptions particularly ha hazardous. Now, before I move on here, um, it's it seems to me, uh, my personal opinion, that the USGS is a little bit spooked here, right? It seems like they might have almost spooked themselves the way that this is written, right? Um, it's almost implying here that we're in a situation now where out of 38 years of repose, we can come into a situation where magma is going to quickly migrate the rift zone, interrupt, and go down to the ocean in three to four hours. That would be the worst, worst case scenario. Not to say it can't happen. We don't know what the volcano can and can't do absolutely. We only have the historical evidence to go on um, as clues for what might come next. Right? So that's what we have to base, base this on here. Um, so we'll address these, these issues separately. I see some of these questions coming through here, right? Um, because migrating down a rift zone is another step of an eruption. The eruption has to take. That's one thing, right? And then it has to choose the correct rift zone, the southwest one, to be able to reach the ocean in these kind of time, time periods, right? So I'm um, not trying to, to, to say to belittle this right because this is this is absolutely true right that the, the this progression can happen quickly but what I, what i think is more important is this next paragraph right here the, the technology we use to monitor volcanoes has changed a lot since 1984. paper seismograms hand collected survey data and visual observations have given way to digital broadband seismic data continuous gps measurements and a network of webcams this means we have a lot more detail about Mauna Loa's current period of period of unrest than has ever been possible before Nonetheless, it is still possible for the situation to change rapidly, and it is difficult to forecast when that might happen. Right? So I think this is 
I would I would lean more on this paragraph than on a previous one personally, right? And of course, please take on the message that be prepared no matter what. Um, so, current episode of unrest of Mauna Loa began in late 2004 with an increase in rates of deformation and seismicity. These rates waned in 2017 and 18 and began increasing in 2019, and have remained somewhat steady since then, with earthquake rates about 20 per day. A noticeable, noticeable seismic swarm occurred from late January to mid-April 2021, accompanied by changes in grout surface tilt recorded by a sonic tilt meter. This was an unprecedented observation that indicated magma had been getting closer to the surface. Another short swarm and tilt event observed in early August 2022. We've covered this a little bit already. And they say the current swarm began on September 22nd and marked the start of a persistent increase in earthquake rate at Mauna Loa's summit. It rose from about 20 per day to 40 to 50 per day, with two days getting as high as 100 per day. Shallow, less than about two miles or three kilometers depth, opening of magma pathways has been detected as an inflationary tilt event. However, the bulk of Mauna Loa's deformation is still due to deeper processes, greater than two miles or three kilometers depth, right, and less than a nine mentioned earlier. That have been occurring since 2019. Other signals, such as seismic tremor that would indicate an eruption is imminent, have not been observed. However, due to the sustained high level of earthquakes, HVOs begin issuing daily updates available on the website. This uptick in activity is a good reminder to be prepared for any eruption, whether you live in a flanks of Mauna Loa or anywhere else in Hawaii Island. Steps to be prepared for an eruption are the same as many other hazards and part of the all hazard preparedness. Includes putting together a go bag with essentials in case of quick evacuation, as well as a communication plan among your family members, and knowing how to get updated emergency information. And of course, uh, uh, we're uh, uh, trying to pass you guys all the official information and talk about it more than um, the other formats allow. So, uh, more resources here um, Civil Defense Preparedness, Volcano Watch articles. Um, but that's the Volcano Watcher this week. So moving along to let's show you guys. This is a seismicity building up to 84. I can get it to respond and get make it a little bit bigger here. Bigger, bigger. Okay. So we have these are earthquakes per hour on the left and time. Of March 84 on the right, right? So looking at the close scale of March 84, you're looking at March 14th, March 15th, and you have the eruption occurring on the 25th right here, right? So in this case, on the evening of the 24th, you see the, the spike in earthquakes over 100 per hour, and then the eruption happens shortly thereafter. And based on this, it's very clear that what the USGS is saying, that activity can progress very quickly from period prior to this, which was fairly low activity, and ramp up fairly quickly, right? However, we're ignoring anything that happened prior to this month in this view. So really on a short-term scale, any one of these events could escalate, right? Um, but you you really are looking for convincing evidence that we're not seeing right now. USGS clearly thinks that we're getting closer to that to be making some changes. Um, however, uh, we have not reached that threshold quite yet, quite yet there. Right? And so, so in contrast to this, let me pull up 1975. Make it bigger too, and give it take five seconds for it to respond here. Come on, there it goes. So leading to 75. Make this bigger too. Right. So it's a slightly different scale here. Earthquakes per day on the left. Um, and we're looking at April 74, right? Now, one thing I, I need to say right now um, that's different from 84 and 74 to today, 2022, is that even though we did have seismometers back in these times, they were a lot less sensitive, right? So we've heard that really you can only compare events that are magnitude 1.6 or greater from this era to ones today, because today's instruments pick up a lot more of the ones smaller than 1.6. So that automatically introduces a complication because it's hard to compare absolute numbers of earthquakes today to absolute numbers of earthquakes in the past because they don't quite compare. Unless you filter out the ones less than 1.6, right? And most of you guys probably don't know how to do that. You're just going to look at the main graph. So really, it's hard to compare the absolute numbers, and it's more about the patterns, right? So that said, 
Uh, here is the pattern for 1975. Uh, eruption occurs on the red line over here. Um, and you can see that there are times where earthquakes spike um, several months ahead of the eruption, right? This is, this is let's see if we're at 450, we're looking at like three months ahead of time. We're looking at six months ahead of time. We're getting, getting up to 1,500 earthquakes per day, right, that were coming out of... Um, Right, you can see the way it built up. This is 500, so 100 is down in here somewhere, right? So you see you're getting 100 earthquakes per day in some of these times here and here. And it builds up to more frequently. And then rather than going up and coming all the way back down, it's going up and staying up at hundreds per day for a while. And then it jumps to thousands per day. This, this a red asterisk here, shallow magnitude greater than four earthquakes beneath Mauna Loa summit. Right, so we talked about shallow earthquakes on a lower summit. We haven't quite got a four yet. We're at, we got a three point five, so I'm kind of getting getting in that ballpark. But if you bucket it a similar way, then maybe maybe in a worst case, we're seeing one of these events, right? Especially if it ramps up, that might lead to an eruption, whether it's within weeks or months, right? Um, you can see here that from the very beginning of that activity in seventy four, it was over a year, in fact, until they were all actually, actually come out of the ground. So it could be years as well. And so it's hard to tell if we're in one of these er eras like this or something more like this. But I would tend to believe we're, we're still back in this zone through here. And there is more coming that's going to be more intense than this. People are going to be more freaked out and more alarmed. We're going to do this all over again. Um, so for now, we're kind of just setting the table for how this is all going to go because I'm not convinced we're really escalating quite yet. Because you can see here, you can build up these events and maybe not quite pump fake, right? But pr progression towards an eruption that happens months later in 75. And the reason, let's see, where is it? I'll show this here. This is the National Parks, uh, National Park website on Mauna Loa. If I can get it to respond, here we go. I want to show you guys is this plot of eruptions in Mauna Loa's history. Right? So I saw one of the papers said that lamentably Mauna Loa's historical eruption record is not very large. We don't know a whole lot. The first eruption really visible is back in the 1830s. No information before that. And you can see here is through time eruptions of Mauna Loa at the summit. Usually um, so you see here, here on the left, it says two days or less and up to one year, up to one month, right? So you have some of them that are lasting months to years and are happening fairly frequently, right? Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because a pattern in the last 50 years has been different. So this is a 74 eruption here, a 75 eruption here, and this is the 84 eruption right there, right? And what's marked here as this big gray box is a period of total inactivity right there total inactivity. Right? So this is not something that we've seen at any other point in this record as far back as the 1830s. Right? So you really have 1830s to 1950 as one kind of activity, and you've had since 1950 a different pattern. Right? And really it's not a whole lot of data, it's hard to really extrapolate and be really 100% sure it's going to follow this pattern. But 75 was an eruption that followed this long period of inactivity, right? It had been um, since 1950, right? That's 25 years, or I think I want to say it was, it was a little less than that, or something. Some other activity that came through. In 84 then followed followed the 75 eruption, right? So here we are now, 2022, and we are likewise at the end, or you know, at the right side of an even longer period of, of total inactivity, right? So this is why. I would personally lean towards considering 1975 as a better analog than 1984 to these eruptions, right? So it's true that 84 came up pretty quick, but 75 took a little longer. And what I have to show you guys next is an excerpt from, this is a, a professional paper 1350 from the USGS, which is uh, the Diamond, is it the Diamond Jubilee, uh, 1987, 75-year um, anniversary of the Volcano Observatory, right? And so this one is a chapter 19, 
which is the history of the 75 to 84 eruptions, right? And so there's a lot of information in here. Um, and I won't go through all of it, of course, but see, similar. There's a plot from um, 1974 to 75. Right? There is an actual 75 eruption right there and showing earthquakes um, greater than magnitude 0 0.1 building up, right? So you see 75 had those early pulses there. Um, and what I wanted to show you guys is this section here. Right, so, there, so the eruption actually only lasted 19 hours um, from July 5th to 6th on Mauna Loa, right? So, but July 7th to 12th was a period of great public concern as an outbreak of lava lower along the Northeast Rift seemed possible in light of both ongoing seismicity and, numerical, uh, and the num numerous historical examples of brief summit eruptions followed within a few days by flank outbreaks. So what they saw was that magma was clearly being intruded into the middle northeast rift zone from July 6th to 12th, with harmonic tremor included, several hundred small earthquakes daily within a northeast rift zone, epicenters uh, clustering near 2,900 meters elevation, just southeast of Pu'u'ula'ula, Ula, and um, once arriving at the site, they went and measured the distance across the rift zone there at Mauna Loa, and they were seeing uh, significant dilation extension, right? Um, as much as four centimeters extension um, over a day. Uh, big earthquakes happening there. However, towards the end of the period, by July 7th, they start seeing contraction at the summit, five centimeters negative, right? So contraction there. As magma drained into the northeast rift zone, then harmonic tremor drops down on July 10th, and then between July 9th and 12th, the rift zone at Pu'u'ula'ula Pu Ula also contracted as much as 5 centimeters, right? So they actually saw what I'm trying to, trying to show here, and maybe I can find the map of the seismicity and not one that I had a chance to pull out ahead of time. So let's see if I can find it there, right here. There is Mauna Loa Summit, and there is the seismicity that followed the eruption, right? So this is still 1975. So this is why I say that 84 was set up by 75, because this is where the eruption 84 emerged. And it emerged because of this movement from the magma in the summit into the rift zone. And this illustrates a little bit of how this volcano actually works. Magma came up into the summit, filled the summit area, was able to unzip the northeast rift zone, move into the rift zone, um, and then essentially settle. And all that's possible only if this side of the volcano is able to move out of the way, right? You're kind of moving this and you open this whole area and unzip it, allowing the, the magma to move in, but not have to rise towards the surface to actually be able to settle into the volcano at depth there. Right? So that's why I think there's some complications, 75 to 84, um, based on that. And for comparison, um, here is a 75 lava flow eruption. This is 19 hours, and that, that was fairly extensive, and so a summit eruption coming, uh, the ne next one we have, might look something similar to this, perhaps, where you have fissures across the actual summit caldera floor, extending the upper southwest rift, possibly the upper so uh, northeast rift as well, and those can send small flows off in both directions, off both sides of the rift zone, could fill some of the summit pits, could move towards the weather observatory up there, um, but uh, probably not going to get that far, right? That's the 75 eruption. Right? And if I scroll it down here, we can move to the 84 sequence somewhere down in here. It's my 84 map. There, there is an 84 map that's showing here. Um, where the eruption began, also in a summit, then migrated down here to this flank of the northeast rift zone, and actually erupted from here. The flow that went towards Hilo is the one that emerged off of this lower elevation on the northeast rift. Right, so this is a place, exact same place where those earthquakes came up in '75. So that's true. It's nine years apart. If you're looking on a scale of a month, you're not going to see that kind of thing, right? And this is just with this with the old data we actually had. So that's why I think that the the overall big picture pattern is important here. Right, and so that said, let me move, move on to a couple other um, other things here. 
when we look at these earthquakes, earthquake patterns, we're looking at the earthquake patterns at the summit of the volcano. So that would be um, in map area, or so, I'm sorry, um, cross section area, something like this. So here's our outline of the summit. This is the main summit caldera right in here that we're normally used to looking at right here. There's actually an outer crack. This is what will be equivalent to the great caldera, the larger caldera of Mauna Loa that's all the way over here on this edge, right? And the center of uplift, let me zoom this way in here, center of uplift, even back in 75 and 84, is right there on that southeast rim. So that's consistent to what we're seeing still today. Right? The same magmatic systems are, are being activated. And when we look at cross-section, this is the area above the volcano. This is the shallow earthquakes we're seeing right in the, in the summit caldera and in the upper southwest rift zone. And the ones we see to the northwest is this intermediate depth cluster over here as a magma is filling in. It's trying to push outwards, right? And it turns out that this part of the volcano is actually able to move and this one is stuck. So it actually builds pressure and it shakes and quakes this area here persistently over and over and over again. Right? So this is the one to the northwest. This is the one right above. In map view, here is the last week of earthquakes. There is the ones just below Caldera, and here's the ones to the northwest. These ones that are in orange, showing a slightly, slightly larger depth, intermediate depth down here to the side. Right? So that matches up to this slightly larger depth here these. That was the last week. And last month looks very similar here on Kilauea. Just more dots on the map as soon as I can get it up over here. There it is. Same area is activated. And when we look at our earthquake counts, they're counting earthquakes in this area as well. On browser. Right. So those earthquakes are the ones up above, right, right below the summit area, right in here, right? And so what I'm trying to show now is the flanks of the volcano. And so we have a magma coming in from below. It has a reservoir marked area and a dike marked area. We'll talk about this here shortly, right? This is the, the two areas of expansion in the volcano. But also, as these fill up, it's going to push to the north, to the west towards Kona, and push to the southeast towards Kilauea. And those are named the, the Kona Fault Zone, and actually the, the Kalakakua Fault Zone in there as well, and Kawiki and uh, Hilea, Hilea Fault Zones here on the southeast area. So they're kind of pushing to the side of those. So a map view over here. These are the areas on the side, Kona, Kona area that you look for big earthquakes as being indicators that that part of the, of the mountain has moved and opened up this zipper seam here for the magma to move into. So there have been, I see, saw this question come up, I'm not sure who or who, which multiple people have asked this question about earthquakes um, on Mauna Loa and connections to eruptions. So there have been associations um, noted by Walter and Amalung here in this 2006 paper, right? And this is the areas that they're looking for these associations, right? So Kona area, um, when this area moves with a big earthquake, that opens up the Southwest Rift area right through here. When Kauiki area, that's closer to Kilauea, when it moves, as it did in 83, 6.6, that encourages Northeast Rift Zone eruptions, right? And the Hilea area, Slightly more complex, but it's actually summit and northeast rift as well, kind of those areas, right? So, really, if you have a big earthquake in one of these side areas, that leads you to believe that the volcano has opened enough to induce magma to come up and fill the areas further, and that is what often leads to an eruption. All this uh, is important uh, because we have not had one of these earthquakes in recent time. Right? So if we had had a big earthquake in a Kona area or the Hile area or the Kaoiki area, we might say, okay, one of the rift zones looks like it's ready to open because we're seeing movement of the flank to allow the rift zone to open. But we're not seeing rift zone opening. We're not seeing the rift zone opening. We're not seeing the rift zone opening in any of these areas yet. 
Someday that'll happen. We'll see a big earthquake somewhere. But that's not happened yet. And that's what also leads me to believe that this eruption will be more likely a summit only eruption. And over half of eruptions on Mauna Loa begin at the summit and stay at the summit. So that's kind of the default, right? And something has to happen unusual to get the lava out of the summit. And we're not seeing the typical clues that we would get that that would be happening. So that once again leads me to, to believe more in a 75 as, a, as a, an appropriate model. Um, to finish off this earthquake volcano cycle, right? what happens is one of these big earthquakes occurs on one of the flanks. That allows um, the magma chamber to decompress and the rift zone unclamps. Magma rises. That can cause an eruption or an intrusion, perhaps, right? We actually have had this cycle of, of argued, argued that this cycle has been ongoing for a while, but we have not had any eruptions, just intrusions have been what we've had for the last few decades here. Um, and of course, once you have that movement of magma from within that chamber to outer areas, even if it's underground as an intrusion, that repressurizes the fault and that can lead to more earthquakes, and the cycle can continue that way as well. So big earthquakes can tr can trigger eruptions, and vice versa. A big, or big eruption, if it occurs, can then move the pressure onto the flank, and then you can get that coming up, right? And that's why, if you don't have one of these earthquakes ahead of time, you begin with the summit eruption first, then you move pressure to the flanks, then you can have that flank earthquake, then you can have a flank eruption more likely, which also begins at the summit and moves flank. Right, that's kind of how it all connects, and it's a cycle. You can, you know, plenty of things can happen. You can move past one phase to another phase. You can you know, get stuck in, in a little mini loop in there. Um, but historically, the correlation between them is this. Here we have plotted over time on this axis um, associations of eruptions, which are triangles, and earthquakes, which are these crosses, right? And so they have marked in light gray. The ones that are Southwest Rift and Hileakona, and in black, Northeast Rift and Kauiki. So, and they've highlighted with these gray bars areas where you do have associations. So, here's 84. There was a magnitude 6 Kauiki earthquake that preceded the eruption by a few months. In 75, um, that did not happen. It didn't, did not happen um, for that eruption. Um, and note, these are just rift eruptions, right? Because summit eruptions are not inducing this, right? So there's not, nothing associated there. You can see the eruptions uh, that also occurred here um, without associations, but sometimes they do, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, sometimes they don't, sometimes they do. So you can see it's not always a sure thing, right? For these flank eruptions, um, Remember, the summit ones aren't plotted on here to, to be associated with these earthquakes as well. So that's kind of that's finishing off a little bit more of the story here. And um, I did want to show this plot from Lockwood and Lippmann, that same 87 paper, uh, showing eruptions at the summit, which is considered to be 3660 meters. That's about 11,000 feet, I believe. We put a northeast rift, southwest rift, and we also have these radial vent eruptions that come off the northwest side sometimes. Right, so this is time once again. So you can see most of the eruptions are happening at the summit. Most of the lines are up here, right? And occasionally you go to the Northeast Rift, Southwest Rift, or elsewhere, right? And when we talk about Northeast Rift and Southwest Rift, you do seem to have a very loose uh, alternation. So here's three Northeast Rift events, and one Southwest Rift event, and two Northeast Rift, and the Southwest Rift, Northeast Rift, and then four southwest rifts, and then two northeast rifts, and then one southwest rift. So see, there's a little bit of back, back and forth. It's not always one, 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 which makes it hard. The most recent 84 eruption was a northeast rift one, right? So you would expect that if it is going to alternate, you'd expect the southwest rift eruption to be the next one on the rift. But as I've been saying, I repeat it again, this... Uh, would more likely be a summit only eruption before it were to move down the rift right and all all just the historical patterns and this is why we're we're digging through this you know uh, so I saw one question coming up here is it is a historical I mean, is, is a history really that useful like how much can we tell 
from the history and you know it is limited it's true but it's really all we got right we have this more detailed record with human observation um, that was recorded by Westerners in the 1830s. Prior to that, we have uh, the Hawaiian observation, which is recorded in different ways through chants and oli. Um, but we don't have the details that we can put in a graph like this from from, the, from that source. Even though observations were were ongoing absolutely at that point as well. So um, that is that was a lot. Maybe I can come back to the questions here, and we'll revisit some of this as needed to, to step through it, Dane. So, all right. Let's... Yeah, um, we do have a couple questions that have come through. Um, one is from Lindsay asks, has there ever been tsunamis from Mauna Loa eruptions? Uh, the earthquakes could cause tsunamis. Uh, so I've talked about different, lots of different kinds of earthquakes. All of them, right? We've talked about just like the tremor of magma moving underground, so not that. We've talked about the earthquakes happening at the summit now when magma is moving and essentially breaking rock to move into areas and swelling the volcano. Those are too small to generate tsunami for the most part. You really need a big one that's happening um, on the flank of the volcano to generate tsunami. Now that said, if one happens on the Kona side, then it could generate a local tsunami. If one happens on, down on the south side, it could generate a local tsunami. Especially if it... Um, activates Kilauea its south flank as well and has some kind of domino effect, right? So one example of that would be the 1868 eruption that moved down the southwest rift to the Kahuku area of the National Park now. So, um, and that one did cause a tsunami, but also cause a Kilauea uh, earthquake as well. And so it's, there's a little, it's a little more complicated than that. But generally, yes, you can have, earth, have earth, big earthquakes that are big enough not from the actual magma itself, but from the adjustments of the volcano that can cause little tsunamis. Yeah, so um, PSA, if you're by the water anywhere in the world and you see the water receding, that's when you turn around and head inland uphill. Right. Right. Um, there are a lot of time, a lot of areas where you don't have to get that far inland. A couple blocks, a few blocks might be enough to get you out of the, the fatal zone. Right. I mean, obviously go as far as you can. Right. What you don't want right. to do is go out to sea and start picking up fish and walking in a reef because it's cool and you've never seen that before. You can go turn and go the other way. That's, that's the, the basic PSA. And the reason that's important is because if an earthquake happens that's a local earthquake and you're at the beach already, there may not be time to be issue a warning. You might have a wave arriving within 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of that event. Right. So if you're at the ocean and you feel an earthquake enough that you're having trouble standing, there's, there's, a, there's a size threshold as well. Usually a magnitude 6 or greater is going to generate a tsunami, right? The smaller ones, not as much. That size earthquake is also going to make it hard for you to stand. So if you're at the beach, have trouble standing, that's the time to turn around and go uphill, right? Don't wait for a siren. Don't wait for a text. Don't, don't wait don't for panic. a post on Facebook. Yeah, yeah don't, don't panic. panic. Proceed, proceed yeah, tell everyone up, around you, hey, fine. time to go. Yeah, we heard about yep. this before. We know it's up here. It's time to move inland. It's all going to be fine, but time to go now. Yep. Yeah, one of those things. So, yes, thanks for that question, uh, Lindsay. Uh, in, in relation to that, Lakota asks, uh, will Hualalai also be affected potentially by a large earthquake, um, as you were talking about, Kilauea was by Mauna Loa, and cause a domino-type effect? We have not seen that association with Hualalai in the past. Um, and the fact really is that Mauna Loa's southeast flank, the Kilauea side, is the one that moves. And the northwest side, the Hualalai side, does not move. It doesn't move because of Hualalai, actually. So Hualalai is like a big uh, doorstop over there on that side of the volcano and stopping it from going anywhere. Um, and Hualalai has got its own character of eruption as well, which is separate. So in short, we don't expect that. Everything is possible with nature, of course. You can't say for sure, absolutely not, no matter what. Um, but that would be a huge, huge surprise if that were to happen. Right. Some things are more likely than others, even significantly so. All right. Next question. Scott asks, uh, gas emissions have remained at background levels. Would we see a rap uh, rapid increase in SO2? Yes, if it's coming to the surface, yes. Um, but that's also one of those kind of last-minute things, right? Yeah. Um, more interesting to me would be the CO2. If the CO2 comes out 
um, earlier. However, Mauna Loa is, is a bit CO2 poor. Just, or is it, is it, is it CO2 resin? It's, it's a, I forgot that detail, whether it's rich or poor here, but uh, it's, it's, it's unusual when it's CO2 emissions already. So it might be hard, hard to detect that change a little bit um, coming through. But that, that's something, that's the gas that would be released at greater depth that would tell you further ahead of time that something might change. So yeah, that's one to look for as well. Um, SO2 might be something that's shallower and and um, more imminent to eruption. So if you see tremor, you see gas, then you might see, okay, it's going to be a few hours till, till it comes out of the ground. Or, or days, depending. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have another one from Scott. Um, <coughs> why moving over the hotspot would uh, logger reposes at Mauna Loa be expected? Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. It's hard to say. I mean, I don't know. Um, I I might I might I think of it slightly different. Um, think of it as a, the size and maturity of the volcano, right? Which is related to the to the its position over the hotspot as well, right? So if it's like the volcano is just coming over the hotspot, it's still young and growing. If it's kind of off the far end, it's full size and huge, right? So when a, when a volcano is full size and huge, it's maybe starting to wane because it's moving off of the hotspot a little bit. And, and when it is that huge, um, you expect each individual piece of it to be covered less often, but the actual pipeline up and through the middle does not necessarily have to have to repose, right? So, um, in fact. From the 1830s to 1950, Mauna Loa was extremely active, right? We're seeing eruptions on average every seven years at Mauna Loa. So very, very active. And, you know, if, if we're in that phase now, that would, you know, which geologically is the same as now, then that would be hard, hard to, to really say, okay, the reposes are going to be longer because of that. So really, it's something different that's affecting reposes in my mind, right? And what's yeah. changed since 1950 is the supply rate to Kilauea. So there's a connection between Kilauea and Mauna Loa that we've discussed in the past a little bit as well. Not direct connection in magma, but there's like a, a poor pressure connection. There's, you know, there's other, other ways that they affect each other. And it appears when the magma flux into Kilauea ramped up, it ramped down from Mauna Loa at the same time. So... I would suggest that the longer poses of Mauna Loa that are occurring now are due to Kilauea's activity more so than its position over the hotspot, which really hasn't changed from 1832 to now. Right? From 1950 to now, it hasn't really moved that much off of the hotspot. So it's something else that would be affected. Yeah. Uh, I, maybe you can fill this in, but um, I was reading something the other day going back on Mauna Loa a long time, and it was suggesting that there was a period a couple or several thousand years ago where Mauna Loa went through a period of about a thousand years with very few eruptions. Um, I, I was trying to remember what that was in that I was reading that in, but I cannot do it for the life of me right now. Um, but are you familiar with that? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I've tried to leap off all the older stuff because that's right. a whole other can of worms. The whole history of the volcano is a whole other talk. That's we're already almost two hours in here. So, you know, yeah. uh, but, but just, uh, just yeah. To show that you know, there's periods that it's yeah. not just that continuous sequence type of that linear progression towards uh, hot, moving off the hotspot type of thing that you might imply yeah. implicitly. The longer history is interesting for sure. Um, the, the big challenge of it is you can't go year to year for the resolution. You can say, okay, this whole thousand years as a whole did this. This next thousand years as a whole or 5,000 years did that, which is interesting to give the context, um, but it's hard to really apply that to now, right? right. You can't say, oh, these next thousand years, well, no one cares about the next thousand years. No. They care about what's happening this next week, right? right? So that's really why we're... we're, we're why I left all of that out today, um, even though there, yeah, there are, are, are periods of, of obviously, you know, like, like just like Kilauea, it goes through periods of, of more filling where you have a summit lava shield and then it goes through less and you have a, a collapse and a caldera forms, right? And so clearly there's a caldera at Mauna Loa and clearly it, it's formed in the last uh, uh, few thousand years here, right? So, I mean, all that's all related, um, but it's outside the scope of what we're talking about today. All right. Well, I think that basically does it for the questions right now. We have uh, more questions.
Well, let's keep, let's keep digging through them. That's because that's all we're talking about today. Is just all right. Let's um, see if we can find a few more in here. Um, one from Richard here. I'm not sure on this one. Uh, when Mauna Loa's crater collapses next, will it collapse down or below Kilauea's height? That'd be a mighty, mighty collapse. <laughs> yeah, that would be a mighty collapse. Uh, there's no way to know that. And anything I say would be a guess. I'm going to guess no. Yeah, I'd bet against it if it was an option in Vegas type of thing. Um, we we believe yeah. so. I did see a, a question through earlier. I'm not sure I'm going to find it because thank you guys for uh, being very active in the chat here. Um, but I'm not going to be able to find the question. But I did see a question that came up that um, was oh, I just spaced. I just spaced it. Um, remind me what we were just what we were just saying my tongue here oh god um <laughs> <laughs> we're talking uh question. yeah we're trying to find a, another question um and we we're just transitioning all right so it was all in my um, head and i you really can't help me on that sorry for that <laughs> right um, um okay we do have another question here if you want to try that I'll come one. back to it okay Wyan Homestead asks, where would Mauna Loa need to erupt to pose a danger to Fern Forest area? That would be very, very difficult. But it would, if it came off the northeast rift to the south and flowed down towards Kilauea Caldera and hit that valley that's just north of the caldera and turned down Highway 11... Something like that. I, yeah, it would it would yeah. take a very unique set of circumstances. I would not worry about it. I would not lose any sleep over Pretty that. Much. No, so you don't worry about it. Um, uh, for, for, you know, really, Puna does not need to worry about Mauna Loa in general. Right. Just that very specific spot east of um, the highway is the only one really in range. Yeah, I mean that's 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 all all I can think of, and yeah, and it's it would be yeah. difficult. And of course, like you know, um. The caveat we always say, once an eruption begins, the flows make their own topography, they can divert themselves, they can migrate in directions. So, you know, if you get one flow, yeah, it, it, it could happen, but it's just, it would take a very unique set of events. And uh, and that's that's that, yeah, no need to worry about that. All right. Looking for a few more questions. Uh, here's one, uh, Kelly asks, in history, did Mauna Loa flows mainly stay within lava one zones one and two? Uh, I could pull that up on the map. Pull it up, yeah, I will show I, it. I think it. I think it. I think it may have gone into Zone Three, perhaps as well. Um, as it approached Hilo, but uh, what do you get? Yeah, I'd have to check on that. Yeah, I'm gonna try and pull it up. Hopefully, I don't crash the computer. So the. I'm finding some of these old questions here. So uh, one of the old questions that I addressed was by Hayes Gray. Man, I keep scrolling. So I keep... Well, shout out to Hayes anyways. All right, I'll keep, keep coming back here. Let's see. People commenting about 84. 84 was was pretty, yeah, certainly concerning. And another example of big of a lot of media coverage. And we didn't have things like Truesdale inundation zones. So really all of Hilo was worried. And we could have, in today's situation, restricted that to just Kalmana being the ones worried about the eruption that happened in 84. So that, that's a little bit different. We're, we're advanced since then. Um... Yeah, it's not. I'm not going to be able to really show that. Um, I don't have a good lava zone two for Mauna Loa on hand. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's see. 
Mike Ramsey, Mike Ramsey has got a question. How do they figure out how big a magma chamber is? Um, they do that by uh, by modeling the actual movement of the ground, right, and the actual scale of it. So you can you can, for example, say something like, um, if the if you have a blade and it, and it was at certain so depth and it swelled with this much magma, what would the surface deform? Like how many centimeters or millimeters or inches or what have you would the surface move at each place? So you can do that, and then you can try to match what you'd what you'd expect to what you actually see. So you match the GPS directions on the surface to the insert insert pattern as well to the model, right? And so like you basically run the model a bunch of times and you say, okay, well, remember, I'm not sure if it's this or that, but here's a range of where it could be kind of thing. And the most likely places where it could be. And so that's kind of where, where they get to get to that. Um, that's like, that gives you more of the location of the magma chamber. And like, that's part one to get at how big it is. And then you're going to get, get at the actual scale of it, right? So you have to have an event that swells it some amount that you can see okay it's well it's, it's swollen by some size and then that gives an idea of the size of the magma chamber as a consequence but measuring the size of a chamber directly very very hard um even kilauea as we're not exactly sure and that's an even better monitored volcano and when we had a collapse in 2018 we didn't even know how big that that upper reservoir was to empty and we're still not sure how big it exactly was we still have a range but it's very hard to know the exact amount um but you can kind of ballpark it right more or less and that's that's the best you can do. So that's that's the best answer we have for that, Mike. And that's where, when I when I say we've had this reservoir and dike at the summit of Mauna Loa. That's coming from that modeling, and not just one group, but all the different groups that have done the modeling have all come up with the same basic geometry, and so that's reassuring too. Got a question. That's a good one from Alan Lowe, who asks, uh, "What do you say Mauna Loa is behaving in a quote unquote textbook fashion?" now or uh, unusual compared to what we know about its past? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that there is a, that we've ever had enough on Mauna Loa to say anything as textbook, right? I think I would say it's typical for the last 20 years, perhaps, right? Since at least 2000, right? Because, you know, we had an intrusion 2002 to 2005, no eruption. We had an intrusion 2014 to 15, no eruption. We had an intrusion 2000. Uh, 16, 17, 18, no eruption. We've had one 2020, 20, 21, no eruption. And so this, so far, seems like the same thing until it shows something different from the last four or five times where we've seen it with not, without an eruption. Um, that's my, my current textbook, right, is this last 20 years or so. But before that, we didn't have the same technology. We didn't have the same information. It's really hard to say what is a textbook before that, right, what's typical before that. And, I, and as I pointed out recently, the pattern pattern since 1975, since 1950, right, 50 to 75 gap, and then 75 to 84, and then 84 to now, that's much different from pre 1950. So it's a whole different, whole different edition of the book, right, that we're in here, which is why we're not really quite sure how to frame things necessarily. All right, got a question about the 1984 eruption. Uh, what was the largest earthquake back before the 1984 eruption? I don't know if you answered that before. The largest one before that eruption? Um, yeah. That was the Kauiki earthquake. Let's see if I can pull it up here. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was 6.6 .6 November of 83. That preceded the March of 84. Yeah, oh, so right. typically what you, what you want to see is you know, something, something larger than a 6 that's going to be the lead to a rift zone eruption more than likely right not to say you you can't erupt a rift zone without one but a lot of a lot of times many times you do and if you do have one it's likely you have an eruption in the rift zone all right we have a ten dollar super chat from bill cole who asks are there any advances in technology that may in the future improve eruption predictions what kind of tech um, one that immediately jumps out to me was the Volcano Watch that was mentioned just a little while ago, the, the modeling that USGS was working on. I'll pull up a link to that one and put it in the chat if you want to read more. Philip uh, might have something to say, though. Are you talking about the uh, lava flow modeling? Yeah. just um, Okay. That's just one of many things, you know. Um, <laughs> and just immediately jumped to mind, and I could find that link. 
Uh, can, can, you, can you read the question again? Yeah. Are there any advances in technology that may in the future improve eruption predictions? What kind of tech? Yeah, okay, yeah. So as far as as far as war lava one lava is actually out of the rift zone going some more, then yeah, what Dane's mentioning, the the the, the prediction of flow direction is something that something that's being being worked on right now. I think the newest thing really is the is the is Insar, right? Like, you know, when I show you guys these models of the blade underground, that's because of Insar that we can do that. Right? We as in human human race not, I, I have no part in that just to be clear right that's all the miami group um but there are new things developing like we've been using tilt meters for a long time um tilt meters have a lot of issues um different sensitivities right so one thing that is is uh in the works is gravimeters right things that measure gravity because if the rift zone is filling with more magma there's more more mass there then you can detect an increase in gravity very very small but measurable right so those are are in 2018 those instruments proved as good as a tilt meters as tracking the buildup of magma so i would not be surprised if in the future we stop installing tilt meters and install gravimeters instead right and eventually the tilt meters will not be replaced kind of thing I would not be surprised if that's that's one. So gravimeter is another one that comes to mind. Right. Um, but really, the the modern revolution has been satellites, right? Insar, GPS, right, is something that didn't have an eighty four for the eruption. So that that's really a, a novelty. Um, satellites also can measure SO two, right? So if there is a puff from Mauna Loa, that'll pick up, be picked up by, by a satellite as well. So there's less chance of missing something if you're not up there, you know, don't have your instrument turned on or something goes wrong and that kind of thing. Yep. One yeah. other one I'd just like to throw out there is the NASA Firms. It's a satellite that tracks uh, thermal signatures. And you can obviously see the eruption with that, but you can also see fires that may potentially start due to the eruption. And you can see those, you know, where those are. In not real time, but just about real time. Um, it's a, an experienced 12 to 24 hour delay, but it'll be there. Yeah, so those, those are right. a few examples. I mean, I'm sure that there's more than that. I mean, we can probably go into more detail. Um, that's a great question for us to pass on to the USGS at some point in time when they're not quite so spread spread out, right? Um, I imagine some of them are coming back from Samoa now as activity in Samoa has been winding down, but. Um, Still, you 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 would expect that um, that information comes out during quieter quieter times there. Um, so, see, I thought I'd do did. one more, or no, we'll just just keep going. All right. I, I, let me let me. I found this question before it scrolls off my screen again. Let me read, <laughs> read this, the, the 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 pattern that I, the question I answered before from Hayes Gray. This is the question is. Is a historical record of Mauna Loa honestly the best method we have to judge what's going on currently? Isn't there a buildup that has a cumul cumulative effect? So yeah, I mean, um, the historical record maybe isn't the best method, but it's the only method we have. Really, that's the answer to part one of that. Part two, isn't there a cumulative effect? Um, yes, there is, but uh, that also includes the flank of the volcano moving, and that kind of um, accommodates the 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 pressure that's been building in there, I'll put it that way, right? So you can you can keep adding magma and then not build your pressure cumulatively if you can move the flank out of the way to kind of keep it. It's like or kind of like walking on a treadmill, right? You're not really going anywhere, even though if you're putting a lot of energy in, into it. Kind of a similar kind of thing in some ways. So, um, yeah. So thank you for that. Um, right. Tabir asks... Um... Would there be an estimate of how much more lava Mauna Loa could deliver than a Kilauea eruption, for instance? I don't have the numbers here in front of me. Yeah. Um, I. So, for Kilauea, um, most eruptions are not very huge, right? 2018 is an exception. 2018 was a big eruption of, of Kilauea. That eruption of Kilauea approaches the size of Mauna Loa eruptions, right? It's, it's in that ballpark of Mauna Loa eruptions because generally, leaving out 2018, most Kilauea eruptions are about 10 times smaller in, in volume than Mauna Loa eruptions, right? So that's kind of the easiest 
back of the envelope answer I can give uh, Tabor uh, to the question. Right. But there, we actually could pull up the, the eruption volumes from from past eruptions of Mauna Loa, and I can list off of those to you guys, um, which are all very huge amounts and hard to compare to anything from to Kilauea unless you start doing things like, okay, well, it's pouring into the summit for two years in a row, and that's a whole, you know, yeah, now, now we can start comparing those volumes being the same or 2018 or those kind of things, right? Right. Um, yeah. Just yeah. for like to, to show that or to reinforce that point, I remember in 2018, the eruption uh, Fisher 8 started really getting going and none of the Kilauea models really worked for it. It had to go, we had to go grab Mauna Loa stuff and start working with, you know, acting like it was a Mauna Loa eruption because the volume was so high. It just didn't make sense for Kilauea. Um, and speaking in context of Mauna Loa made it, you know, make a little bit more sense at least. Just so yeah, Mauna Loa is bigger. Yeah, and how much how much more lava really depends, right? It depends on which eruption, how long it lasts, where it's coming from. Is it a rift zone? Is it the summit? But overall, Mauna Loa is a bigger volcano. It has bigger eruptions, and about an order of magnitude, about a factor of ten larger. Best right. best uh, estimate answer there. We have um, one more from. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you have, if you have one lined up, I have a couple too. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, uh, one from uh, Kanika who asks, is there a good way to tell where it will come out? As there was one time it was going into the ocean, I think, in Captain Cook area. I think that would be the 1950 eruption that we're talking about there. Um, it can get down to the ocean in some areas in as little as a few hours, right? But a good way to tell where it's coming out. It's hard to tell until it's actually starting to happen, right? When when it's starting to happen, you see the earthquakes collecting on the area. That's what happened in Leilani. That's how, how you knew Leilani was going to be at the eruption site in 2018, is the earthquakes collected near the surface in that area. Once that happens, that's the likely breakout site. However, um, Mauna Loa's rift zones are very topographically high, and the flow could come out of the rift zone and go either like only to the west or only to the east, or it could do both. And obviously... That affects whether it gets to the ocean or towards communities or not, right? So that's another another aspect of that. Um, the other part of that could be if you have if you if you can expect a, a flank eruption from somewhere like the Southwest Rift, you also would would be looking for those earthquake, the big earthquake that precedes it that opens the flank. And if you see one on the Kona area, then you might believe that the where is going to be the Southwest Rift. And if you see one in the uh, Kawiki area, you might believe that the Northeast Rift is going to be the where it's going to erupt very broadly, and then you still got to wait for exactly where it's going to happen on there. And once it picks one spot, fishers can migrate, right? Um, in 84, they migrated from Ula Ula down, downhill, right? So um, they can progress, and I believe it spawned, uh, I forget how many, but a whole bunch of different flows came off of the rift zone, right? And that probably helps split the lava, so not all of it was in one flow, and spread it spread it out and sent them in different paths, and none of them ended up destroying much anything, even though they they did threaten the saddle road. So right. hard to tell exactly yeah, where, um, but if you had to guess and bet, over half the eruptions at the summit stay at the summit, begin at the summit and stay at the summit. You're right, that's where the safe money would be. All right, you have some questions lined up, you said? Yeah, so I see one here from Mark Sorensen. As a whole fills up at Kilauea, will the magma rate increase at Mauna Loa? That's an interesting question. Also also hard to tell tell the answer for that, but that's kind of one of those those theoretical, um, fun to think about things, right? Um, especially in the context that Kilauea just filled enough to have its own summit intrusion just last week, right? So that's kind of a curious thing to me is, Another way to think of this is, did what happened on Kilauea, as far as having enough, we call it overburden, enough, enough stuff piled above on top of the ground to have enough pressure that the magma, rather than coming up, wants to go sideways and inject into the rock underground. That seems to have happened for the first time last week on Kilauea. Um, wow, lava is actually still coming out, right? Unlike pre-eruption um, in 2021 and 2020. Um, and so if we've reached that point for Kilauea, could you possibly have more pressure under Mauna Loa as well? And yeah, I suppose you possibly could. The the paper from um, Gonerman et al. that describes the connection between Kilauea and Mauna Loa 
describes that the pore pressure connection that they have would suggest more like a like a six month time frame for the pressure from one to propagate all the way through to another one, right? Like one eruption turns off for the pressure to build up enough and for it to migrate and express at the other volcano. So given that study, I would say that that maybe not from filling in a hole per se, but like, you know, from changes in, in Kilauea's eruption, if let's say the eruption rate slows down for some reason because of what's happening on Kilauea's own dynamics, then you could have an effect on Mauna Loa as well. That's, that is possible long term, but it's nothing you could exactly predict um, in advance. Right? So that's, that's an interesting one there. Um, another question, I'm not sure what the username here is, but if lava keeps filling, filling to the side, will it eventually come out of the side? And so I just wanted to clarify that a little bit here. When, when, I, when we talk about this, this uh, blade of lava that ex exists within a volcano, it, it is like a, it's a long thing, and it's basically following the shape of the rift zones. Um, but um, the, the, the biggest pressure on that is coming from the mountain above it, the actual weight of the mountain pushing down, right? So it's, it's being held in quite a bit. Where it wants to push is it wants to push the rift zones apart sideways and not along its length, right? So that blade wants to get fatter, more so than it wants to extend, right? So right now it's doing the getting fatter, getting fatter, getting fatter, and that keeps it at the summit. For it to extend, that's when you have to have the rift zone open to have a pathway for it to actually extend. So we saw a little bit of that, a little bit of that extension only within the summit region in the southwest area um, of the summit, 2014 to 15. Um, but it really did not go past that, right? And um, that is uh, the best answer I can give to that, right? So coming out the side, I would say, as a, as, you know, as a, as a rift eruption, um, that is the ultimate result of what's going to happen at the volcano. But to clarify the, pa the pattern, the sequence of it there, you actually should have that, that blade getting fatter first before it can start shooting down either way. If that makes sense. All right. Um, do some more. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Not sure how to answer this one. Uh, we'll figure it out. Michael asked, does Guacaloa military base have a cause to be concerned and are they in the loop current on current updates concerning Mauna Loa? Uh, well, we are in contact, uh, generally speaking, with Guacaloa. Uh, command. Um, yeah. There is no increased threat to them, more so than anyone else at this point in time, until something actually does happen. However, those summit eruptions um, do get closer to both the, the Monolo Weather Observatory and PTA than any other infrastructure anywhere on an island, right? So. There is, a, there is a little bit of a higher risk. If you were to, say, get all the flow coming off one side of the rift zone from the summit, you might possibly reach into some PTA land or the weather, weather observatory or those roads up in that area up there. Um, but as of right now, there's no reason for them to do anything apart from, generally speaking, they should have an evacuation plan. They should have preparation plans, all that stuff they hopefully have in place. And if they don't, hopefully they're working on it. And if they don't, hopefully we can help them with that. And uh, that's... that's uh, all we know about PTA, really. Yep. Um, yeah. Probably be good to call them <laughs> next day or two. Just to check up. Uh, we have a question here. We have a $5 donation from Bill Cole with a question of, in normal conditions, are backcountry hikers allowed to hike on the Mauna Loa Caldera floor? Uh, yes. In normal conditions, yeah. yes. However, there are no trails to get down there. So you have to be off trail and it's not easy to do and you're at, at altitude. And if you get down in there, you got to figure out how to get out of there. So most people actually don't. And if you get hurt, you're on top of a mountain type of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's, it, right. it's, it certainly is, is, po is possible and um, something that we've seen people do. And I've done that. And yeah, interesting, interesting area. but. All closed now, as hopefully you caught at the top of the broadcast here. Final one from uh, let's go from final one from Richard. We've been on for two hours now. Uh, ask is the water table at 
in Mauna Loa at the same height as Kilauea? No. Because, because uh, the water and the groundwater is dominated by two things, right? One is the actual just shape of the whole island as a whole and sea level and all of that. But it's also influenced greatly by the dikes, the hardened rocks within the rift zones and surrounding areas and those hard layers that are impenetrable. And we know that there are springs like up at 11,000 11, feet on Mauna Loa, right? So that automatically is would be in the air above Kilauea, not the same water table. Right? Different perched aquifer, similar to Kilauea's where, you know, Kilauea Summit's got perched aquifer also held up by the by the frozen magma blades in the summit region. So similarly, Mauna Loa's got that as well, and you kind of have that, that area up there as well. There are multiple aquifer is likely they're likely and not all properly mapped um because you know but you, you do have several zones of springs at different elevations come up to you right so um but the short answer is no right um so yeah. I, I mean there's, there's a few others that i mean i, mean, I know i've been on for a while but um some of the ones that are easy to answer um Someone, I think it might have been Hayes again, asks. I can't find a question again now, but about does Mauna Loa have the there has have the thinnest, fastest lava on Earth plus plus the hottest? Um, no, not really. It's not really that that different from Kilauea. Um, and um, there are lavas that are actually more viscous, but different chemistry. Um, and yet. Yeah, Hawaiian lavas are are among the hottest, yeah, but it's not it's not unique to Mauna Loa more so than Kilauea. It's you know, what you imagine, what you see out of Kilauea, that's what you expect out of Mauna Loa in general. Is the answer to that question there? Um, yeah, I'm looking to see if I see any more. Yeah, if we get them all, then it's great. Is this presentation being recorded, yes, this will be available online. I mean, some of these I've already answered in chat as well. That's the thing. Right, but not everyone's going to read the chat. Yeah. And I don't know. There's a lot of chats really long, so I'm not sure what else I can find <laughs> on here. Right? Yeah. But I'll scroll, scroll, scroll. If there's anything we haven't answered, if you guys want to put it, drop it back in the chat one more time at the end, then we can see if anything pops back up here. Yeah, if you missed, if we missed it, go ahead and redrop it. So, alert level has not been raised; it's still the same. Um, we have been talking for a while about how maybe, maybe the current level wasn't as warranted, and certainly now it is. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm fine with it. I mean, I'm just going to call this uh, advisory plus, and now we have two different delineations. It solves the issue that I was bringing up with. You're not using green. It's like, all right, we'll just have two yellows then. Like, fine. Yeah. You know, but the fallacy the there issue. is that the colors don't correspond to frequency of updates. So there's nothing. One has got nothing to do with the other necessarily, right? I know. <laughs> I mean, they're obviously saying the heightened activity is the reason why they're doing it too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's 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 the reason, right? You know, so yeah, like for 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 Tau, started off unassigned because we had no information, and they were giving daily updates, monthly, weekly updates, then daily updates, and then it went back to weekly, and then it went down to monthly, and then they put it to green after that. That's just one yeah. example. And yeah, um, in Hawaii though, that's rarer um, type of thing. Like I don't know of us doing that. Um, yeah, it hasn't happened, it happened, but things haven't changed. Matt, have, 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 they haven't been, right. you know. Right? So, con considering the short history of the alert system, right, the whole color code system, it, just ha it hasn't happened in that period of time in Hawaii for it to for it to occur. Whereas it has happened in recently in Samoa, and it has happened in Alaska. Right. I was messing around with USGS, joking with them, and they were saying, "Oh, does that mean we need to make the the air the air code for the aviation code uh, saffron?" 
you know, instead of <laughs> yellow, raise it up to so, so advisory plus and then saffron. If... <laughs> so I see a comment here from Janice Norman, a long time here, Mahalo Janice, and she says she's got friends in Ocean View who are legit freaking out right now because the flows are quite recent in that area. So advice for Ocean View, um, always be prepared, but there is nothing more alarming right now than there was in March last year, for example, right? And March last year was was a, a pump fake as we've been as we've been calling it. And really, you know, um summit eruption will happen first. If it progresses to a rift zone eruption immediately, then um that's when you need to be taking action, right? Is that that moving to the rift zone phase is when you want to want to have that um everything ready and grab your bag and start moving stuff out kind of thing at that point in time um but until that happens um just make sure the bags are ready communication plans are ready evacuation routes are are have been considered right one thing you guys can do with the um the steepest ascent lines um which is another post that Dane put up on HawaiiTracker.com recently, is you can see like where the, the likely paths of lava flow actually are. And if the flow comes down a certain direction, will it cut off a certain road? Will it cut off your driveway? Like, you know, what is the localized evacuation plan for your property um, beyond what civil defense and the county is gonna, gonna do for the larger infrastructure and roadways and those kind of things? That's That's something else to consider there so mahalo for passing that on janice damon tucker was mentioning something about the m3 cam but um i'm trying to pull it up and it's just solid black for me yeah i didn't, I didn't. so I'm gonna... yeah yeah it's just solid black right now uh, I'm not recording that one. I should, I'll, I'll enable the record. I didn't. I thought that one was down. Like I thought I checked that one this morning and it was a down cam. Did it? But did I'm it? Sure. Update its. Uh... It's updated the timestamp. The timestamp's updated, but it's still black. Right. Well. No. What is it you want us to see on there, Damon? We don't see it. It was saying steam. Some kind of steam. Oh, well, steam's normal. You're steaming Mauna Loa Summit all the time. That's not any cause for concern or anything different. So thanks for bringing that up once again. Um, mm. Yeah, there's, there's, there's been magma. I mean, just like Kilauea, just like the rift zone, right? Whenever you have an eruption, there's still magma that sits in the rift zone. It sits in, the, in that case, in the, in the summit reservoir, right? And we know that there are intrusions. And you know, last year, the year before that, you know, in 2014 and 15, 10, 20 years ago, like there's, there's magma in there. Not that far down, yeah. So it's uh, certainly going to steam. Um, if you see an increase in the steam, um, maybe. But I would like to see an increase, like in a thermal image, right? That's why there's a thermal camera up there, is to can actually pick up pick up a change in the temperatures on a caldera floor. Like that's that would be more more telling than actually seeing steam up there. We, you know, we we for many years answer the same question on Kilauea at the steam vents like the steam vents are extra steamy today what's going on it's, well it's just the weather is different today and, uh, never meant anything for Kilauea and uh, unless something really significant is visible then likely does not mean anything in Mauna Loa either right uh, it looks like it was there yesterday as well the steam I'm looking to see it um, just watching the 24 hour time lapse yeah, it's just got a steamy area, it looks like. All right, we have a 1999 uh, Super Chat from Jewelry. Appreciate that with an email. Do we have so, a couple more questions that came through if you want to try those? Sure, yeah. There was a question about um, how air, aircraft can be, can be picked up on a seismometer. And it's just a vibration in the air that picks up. I mean, the seismometer is an instrument instrument that's shallowly buried in the ground right so it's you know it's it's near the surface 
it's underground, but it's near the surface, right? So um, when a wind is blowing little rocks across the surface or vibrating, then it actually can pick up, pick up, pick that up on a seismometer. And when a, when an aircraft flies over, you pick that up as well. If it's like lightning and thunder, that picks up on a seismometer too. So we can, it, they're actually very sensitive and pick up all these different signals and they have characteristic shapes on the plot. So you typically can know what's what and what's important and what isn't. Um, but the trimmer and, it, and the aircraft can appear kind of like trimmer because it kind of it's, it's a longer period continual thing. But aircraft come and go, and trimmer can come and go also. But usually it comes and stays for a while before it wanes off. It's not usually off and on and off and on and off and on as much as much. Although that can happen. And if it does happen in that pattern, then it's minor. Magma is moving, but it's minor, and it's not like a huge movement of all of it coming up to erupt kind of thing. So underground little movements are expected, especially as a, that magma moves from one part of that blade further over, progresses, expands, fill, fills in the area that's expanding with the flank moving, moving and all that. All right. We have a question from Michael. Um, the composition of lava in the 2018 fissure dated to 1955, yes. Uh, so is there old lava in Mauna Loa that may date back if it came out? So yes. Like grab all that old stuff and push it out first. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So at the summit it would probably be eighty four. If they went down the rift, it would depend where on a rift. You have to find that, right. that previous eruption, but it could be eighty four. It could be fifty. Yep. Some something else. Something Anywhere else. Forty. Yep. Forty nine. Could be. Who knows? Yeah. All right. Well. um Scott asks, does Mauna Kea have any relation to Mauna Loa? Well, many relations, but not um, relevant to eruption, um, not, as not as much. Right. Mauna Loa makes, or Mauna Kea makes for a good, uh, show you what Mauna Loa might look like in the future type thing. A good analog over later in life stages of Hawaiian volcanoes, something along those lines, but yeah. Definitely um, related, but in terms of relevancy now. All right, do you see any more you gotta you want to go through? Um, let's see, a lot of thank you guys for being so active in the chat. I haven't got through to the end yet. Um, um there's one here from the Basset Basset family. Um. What do you think the potential for a majority of the subdivisions in Puna to be wiped out again in a single lava flow? I think that'd be referring to something like the uh, Isla Al flow, like 15th century. Yeah, I mean, that, that's another one of those that we call that a whole single flow now, right? But that one is, could have lasted 60 or 80 years, right? Maybe 20 at least, you know, a long time, right? Like, would you call it the entire pool all one flow? No, I mean we had all the events, right? Like sixty-two G and all that kind, right? Like, yeah. So when you when you have when it's happening year to year, you divide it more and you start calling them different parts, different episodes, different flows, right? But if you, if it's back five hundred years ago, we're going to call it all one event. So yeah, we map all the Isla Al lava flows as one big unit, but it wasn't one big sheet that came down and went all over the ocean in one week kind of thing. It was like a incremental piecemeal thing that occurred. Um, although the certainly were some big delivery systems, big lava tubes feeding lava down, down uh, over the course of the eruption, right? So um, unlikely. It's unlikely that you wipe out any single area with one big flow, honestly. You know, most of the time, you have some topography that you, you end up ha having some pieces left over. Right? But yes, most of Puna um, would be worried about an eruption from Kilauea Summit or from that Middle East rift zone um, were to flow to the north, right? Which is less likely than going south, which is steeper path of the ocean. Yeah. So usually it's usually the lava flow is north will stall and when south take over. So during the pool era. All right. Um, well, I think that gets through everything I see. I saw one, where was it? I lost it.
We have one from Richard. Uh, does Monoloa have more power than Kilauea, or is Kilauea more powerful um, just because it's lower and younger? I think I think Monoloa's magma storage network is larger, so that means it can put out bigger flows for that reason. And maybe that means more powerful, but it's probably just more volume, really. Right. Yeah. It's like I guess you'd be arguing that'd be like erupted vigor, and it's like just go you know Google a uh, curtain of fire on YouTube and uh, Mauna Loa, and you'll see some power right there. Um, it's hard to quantify like who's more powerful though, you know, type of thing. I mean, it's, things are just bigger, right? I mean, so you have like you know a fisher and Kilauea could be pretty massive. It could be two miles long, it could be five miles long. A Mauna Loa could be ten miles long or fifteen miles long, and you know it might only be shooting the same height, only two hundred feet or something like that. But it's just like a lot longer, a lot larger area that it's covering, right? And it might be coming out faster. I don't know. So I mean, it's you know, it's yeah, yeah popping powerful is fine, but you know, but, but really more technically, is the the volume and the rate is larger, right? And that was more true before two thousand eighteen because now now that puts it now there's some overlap there. Well, let's see. Question. Go ahead. Question from Michael as uh, the current Pahala coast earthquakes how are they related to our volcanoes and if they are what do they what do we know about the relation to uh our volcanoes especially Mauna Loa we know very little is the answer we'll know a lot more after the studies that were done this past summer were, 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 were released because they did a whole imaging of that whole area um but it's thought that they are part of the hotspot feeder system so the hotspot comes up and then it splits to each volcano and it seems like that's the near that zone of split. And so the Pahala cluster is actually split into several populations of earthquakes. One is on the Mauna Loa side, one's on the Kilauea side, and those might be the, where those connect into each volcano. They've both been super active, and it, one for Loihi as well, right? Um, but they've both been very active, and so if, it's, if that's all true, what it's telling us is that the supply of magma into the volcanoes is healthy and robust, and that hasn't changed, so would not expect anything to wind down like for decades um, anytime soon. Um, Iloia and Mauna Loa both, both appear to continue to be active for a while. This would be the, the best guess if that's what the earthquake zone is, is telling us. So right. one, one question from Bodidly, what's the age of the next island up the chain? That would be Maui, right? Um, Maui goes it goes back to about a million years, but there are eruptions on Maui that are within the last thousand years, right? Um, so Maui is also considered to be geologically active by that definition. Quick one there. Uh, quick question came through. How imminent is this? Just joining the discussion. Talk about Mauna Loa. Not imminent. So maybe I should go pull up the cartoon again, right? But eruption is not imminent. This is, I mean, really, in summary, we're looking at a, 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 a similar increase in activity as we've seen in recent years, in the last 20 years. But we're seeing possibly new procedures coming into play here, right? We're seeing the National Park actually closing the summit when one of these events occurs. Um, we're seeing the USGS go to daily updates um, now that this has occurred, right? So um, that's great. Um, I, don't, I don't know that under the prior organization that USGS had capacity to, do, to go to daily updates, something like this were to happen, right? There was a point in time, and I think I pulled up an interview from 10 years ago, and at the time, Frank Truesdell is the only geologist at HBO who was actually was present for the previous Mauna Loa eruption, right? And that's not changed, right? He's still the only guy who was around for the last eruption in 84. You know, even the scientist in charge came in just slightly afterwards. One of the things I was reading about in 84 was that um, the HBO, you know, they're understaffed already, whatever, they uh, got bombarded by calls. Like to the point where they didn't even have a public information officer at the time. So one of the geologists had to go field calls and they ended up having to basically get at the community to just operate a call center to help them because they were just completely overwhelmed. 
It's like, yeah, we don't want to do that dance again. Um, we've come a long way since 84. And yeah, that's part of why yeah. we're here is stuff like that. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's really because of this more, you know, in the last decade, we'll call it, right? There's more recent ramp ups and activity that USGS has realized that they needed to expand their Mauna Loa division, right? And even if it's, you know, because it used to be that Frank was the only geologist looking at Mauna Loa and everyone else was Kilauea, which is, you know, great if Kilauea has been erupting for the last 200 years. But if you're worried about Mauna Loa in the future, you, you want to to pivot a little bit. And I believe that that has happened in the last decade here, right? So that that's I think that's part of it as well, part of the consideration here. But USGS is more nimble. They have more staff, and they're able to respond in, in ways that they weren't before. And I, I like the precedent. I like the precedent that they're going to give more information more often. That's great. Um, but we're not quite clear what the pattern is how normal it is it is because it's the first time we've seen it happen right all right um another question from hayes grade is a recent 15 micro radians increase in kilauea's tilt plane any of this mauna loa concerns uh no that's a localized kilauea effect right in fact even even the rift zones of kilauea aren't picking up that signal anywhere beyond the, the immediate summit region of kilauea that is a separate thing. And... See, did we talk about the Mauna Loa 84 eruption enough? Should I bring up that graph again? I was asking for that. There's a graph of the, yeah. of the 84 seismicity. Right, and how it kind of um, in a short term built up. But you know, let, let, me, let me do a little more of this. Like, let's come back to this chapter 19 of Freshman Paper 1350. And we can actually look in detail at what happened ahead of that month of eruption on 19, 1984. So I just need this to respond. And scroll back to the right here. This is this is something like that. Hopefully, I'm not making anyone too dizzy with that. But okay, here we go. Um, you're monitoring temperatures, right? So monitoring fumaroles. They first saw. Rising temperature in November 18th, 1983, so a few months ahead of the eruption, right after that earthquake in Kawiki, they saw an uh, increase in hydrogen gas and in temperature as well. Um, let's see here. Right. Well, it was in 84. I think that there was a section in here that's before this. Um, last record temperature okay here's a temperature it's not really not really too convincing on there honestly hydrogen not too convincing fever rolls from the 85 fissure it's still present in 1977 or 75 fissure in 77 but okay here here we go this is the section I was looking for. Pre monetary phenomenon to the 84 eruption. Pre eruption seismicity. So, shallow and intermediate depth earthquakes increased in frequency between, beneath Mauna Loa from 1980 to 1983, culminating with a swarm of intermediate depth earthquakes. Those are the ones in the northwest. Beneath the northwest flank in mid September 1983. And so, mid September 83, before November 83. First motion suggested that these resulted from increasing lateral stresses generated in the summit and upper southwest rift zone, possibly as a consequence of intrusion of magma beneath the summit and upper upper rift zones. So that's where we are. That's the phase where we are now, right? As are this, you know, earthquakes and intrusion and all that, right? So then at 6:13, November 16th, the 6.6 .6 earthquake on the south flank occurred. Like that was what was indication that there was more to come 
that eruption. And that's what we have not had yet. If that happens tonight or tomorrow, then we'll, we'll obviously revise and update again. But at present, we have not crossed a threshold like that, right? So just leading up to the whole um, March increase in, in earthquakes. There had been earth, in, earthquakes in 83 before that, back to 1980, the big one in November 83 that had an extensive aftershock sequence that was 20 kilometers across, 15 miles across, the northern perimeter bordering Mauna Loa's northeast rift zone. So that gave you a clear indication that it was actually moving the flank all the way to the rift zone, which is where we saw that previous 75 seismicity built up. All right, then seismicity remained high in the vicinity of Pu'u'ula'ula until merging with eruptive seismicity on March 25th, 1984. So that area kept activating seismically for those whole three or four months. Right? Obviously dropping down in that month just before then. The number of larger earthquakes rose persistently as the time of eruption approached, while the daily frequency of smaller earthquakes, smaller magnitude 1.5, showed a more episodic increase. Peaking one week before the eruption, but decreasing to below average on the day before the outbreak. The overall distribution of earthquakes in the 16 months before the eruption is remarkably similar to the distribution of earthquakes in the 16 month period before the July 5th, 1975 eruption. So that's 1918, which is this figure here, distribution, right? Those same areas before both earthquakes and the same ones we're seeing now to some degree, although we're seeing more underneath the actual summit region. So I'm gonna stop at that, stop it there, right? You know, but so just just point out that this one graph that only goes back to March 15th doesn't quite tell the full story there, right? So you could say that, yeah, if we look at the period of March, it comes on pretty suddenly in March, that's true, right? But you know, there have been other little events and going back to months and months and 16 months before this that uh, uh, were part of this pattern too. So hopefully that answered some more of those 84 right. questions. Yep. Uh, Meredith asked, could it reach Queen K Highway and cut out people from the airport? Well, it's too soon to talk about, about any of that is the answer, right? Like, yeah, I mean, Mauna Loa um, covers half of this island, so lava flows could go many places on this island. And yes, it could cut, it could cut off that highway. But there's no indication of it doing anything like that anytime soon, so it's, it's almost irresponsible to say, like, oh yeah, that could happen, because it's not there's no sign of it happening anytime soon right now, you know, but long term, sure, that is a hazard. All right. Um, got another one that came through from Jennifer. Would the lava more likely go west towards Kona or east towards Ocean View? Say that again? That's on a southwest. I assume this is like a southwest rift zone eruption. Would lava more likely go west towards Kona or east towards Ocean View? It, yeah, it, that's. Could be either. Could be either. Um, if it comes out of the Southwest Rift, it could be either, and it could be both yeah. at the same time. And you, you actually would want it to be both because then you have the flow split in half, and not all of it goes in one direction, which means it's less likely to get as far and to destroy what it's going to destroy. Might, yeah, might not even reach the ocean. Might not, yeah, thing. if you're lucky, because most 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 habitation is just closer to the ocean than to the summit. Yeah, there's a long, long distance between the summit and inhabited areas that this thing can mess around in and not really impact people directly other than, you know, SO2 and the, the side things of the eruption, but not lava in your yard type thing. Um, I believe that's all that I see. Yeah, we've discussed the long-term patterns, the recent eruptions. We've discussed the steam, the presence of steam. We've discussed... A little bit of the sequence sequences that occur. We discuss some of the dynamics inside, part of the patterns when it's happened recently. Um, let's see. We've talked about connections to Kilauea. We've talked about possible impacts and where we are in the, in, the, in the sequence, which is very very early on and not even guaranteed to go anywhere yet. Nothing is imminent or even guaranteed to erupt at this point in time. Um, talked about yeah. saddle, PTA, the weather observatory. 
I think we've covered it as much as we can today. And so uh, we can, we'll re revisit this again next week. We don't have to be quite so thorough unless something keeps happening. You know, um, I won't be surprised if it's not much new to talk about next week. I'm on a little to be honest. Yeah. If there is, I mean, we will. Two and, a half hours, two and a half hours to talk about an eruption not happening. You know, <laughs> like an eruption hasn't happened. You know, if eruption does happen, we'll be on again. You know, um, if anything significant does happen, we will go live and bring you with that, uh, bring you that, you know, when it does or if it does. Uh, otherwise, the place to, we broadcast is on YouTube and on Facebook, Hawaii Tracker on uh, Facebook and on YouTube. It is Hawaii Pod. Uh, we do our updates 5 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time on Thursdays. Every Thursday we try and hit them up. And again, if something goes, you know, off, we will go live and, you know, uh, bring you that. Otherwise, you know, make sure to leave a like, subscribe, all that stuff. And I believe that is it for me. We will be on Hawaii Tracker if you want to uh, see what's going on tomorrow. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next uh, update. I do see a couple more. Couple... Final questions here. You know, one relates to this whole whole like evacuation plan, a civil civil defense, and you know, um, there is a uh, uh, a task that Haima has been assigned from the the state congress to come out with a, a evacuation plan for all Mauna Loa. That's likely to come out next year. So we'll talk about that as it happens, right? Um, uh, civil defense apparently uh, has plans, but they have not been made public. So we cannot comment anything about those. Um, of the flows that Mauna Loa has put down and covered this island, over half of it we've, we've mentioned, or nearly half of it right now, um, they do reach the resort areas in the northwest, but those are um, unique situations that also not worth worrying at this point in time. So kind of to sum it all up, really, there is at present no indication lava is going to come out of the ground or go anywhere. Right? If it does come out of the ground, it's likely to stay in that big hole at the top of the mountain and not go anywhere. If it does go anywhere, it's not going to go very far. So no need to worry for now. Good time to be informed. Thanks for tuning in and getting informed. Prepare. Get your preparations ready for all hazards, as we've said. But really, there is you know, there is no... We're not going to be going live again tomorrow with more Mauna Loa stuff because there's going to be nothing else to talk about. Nothing else is happening. Nothing's happening. That's the bottom line, really, right? That's what Dan is saying. So if something does happen, we'll, we'll come up and share that. But really, it's winding down already from the graphs I showed you at the very beginning. This, the, the peak of this event was already several days ago. And um, we're just going to go with the flow here, right? So we will catch up on Kilauea. When we, we've postponed Kilauea a couple weeks now. Um, some interesting things happening there, but... Pretty minor, nothing worth interrupting uh, the talk of the week. town. So we'll, we'll catch up on, on, on Kilauea next week. We'll catch up on Samoa. Samoa is basically mostly, if not all, wound down. But we'll catch up on that a little bit as well. There's a little bit more we can say on that. And that is that for today. I've talked enough. So they already said this goodbye. I'll say mine, and I'll shut up here. So from HawaiiTracker.com, till next week, this is Dan DuPont. I'm Philip Ong. Aloha, everyone.